Doing all right? Yeah, how about you? I'm um, pretty good. I just want to, before we go live, I'm not, we're not live yet. I just want to make sure everything was good on the audio side of things and all that. Are you going to be a voice or a face? Uh, I'll be voice because my camera will be going to my stream. So I okay. can't use it in two places. All right. all right. All right. Do you want to see my face or not? It's up to you. I don't really care. <laughs> no, I don't mind. Okay. Okay. I'll just leave it the way it is then. Uh, right. No problem. No problem. That sounds good. Uh, Something's going wrong with my audio, so one second, because it's peaking. Ah, okay. Um... I think that's why. Okay, there we go. I fixed it. I was just an idiot. That's fine. Right, okay. Are you cool to go live? Um... Yep. Okay, I'm just going to quickly uh, like uh, deafen myself in that. I'll be right back. I'll just introduce the stream and then... Um... And then, yeah, let's, let's do it. One second there, mate. Th thank you for being so patient, by the way. No, that's fine. Cheers. Mate. One sec. All right. Hello, everyone. I think history is quite good, yeah. I like him. Which I'm surprised by, Carson, because you're supposed to be US, and this is very much a UK time zone debate. <clears throat> okay, I've just introduced the stream. Would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Liquid Zulu? Uh, sure, so I'm Liquid Zulu, I'm an anarcho capitalist, and I do videos on uh, YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Liquid Zulu. Sweet, sweet. So, we got here because I put a post out on Twitter saying, like, you know, does anyone want to debate capitalism versus socialism? And you're an anarcho capitalist, so do you want to tell us about what you're going to advocate for? What system? Sure, so anarcho capitalism is essentially anarchism with Austrian economics. So, uh, the Austrian economics, that's uh, to do with the Austrian School of Economics, of course. Uh, you know, people like uh, Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, uh, Friedrich Hayek, people like that. It's all about uh, praxeology and a priori reasoning about economics. And uh, the anarchism side of it, that's specifically Rothbardian anarchism, so uh, taking the Rothbardian natural law approach and essentially anarchism there would be uh, advocacy of adherence to natural law, you could describe it as. All right, so you're actually a natural law theorist. Yes. All right, that's going to be interesting. I haven't, uh, I haven't, I don't think I've ever spoke to an anarchist who's a natural law theorist. I know Austrians. I've spoke to Austrians um, before, and um, I don't think I agree with like, um, Aust for example, Austrian economics' definition of socialism is very broad. I think from from my perspective. Um, for example, the United States and in, 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 for many Austrians is considered socialist, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that we might have to like, obviously iron out some, like, you know, talk around terms and, you know, iron out some, some sort of linguistic differences or conceptual differences that we might have, um, before we start, but it's very interesting to hear you say natural law. So in that respect, I'm assuming you would agree that any, any economic system is really bound towards ethics it has to be subject to some sort of moral principle of how we all live our lives and um politically um uh, well some notion of justice that would necess necessitate one one system over another yeah definitely um so um rothbard goes over this uh in ethics of liberty that um economics and ethics really aren't these like two completely separate fields as they might be thought of because uh, in economics there are all sorts of very core concepts like you know property and all that where it's it's definitely a legal term right so you need to have a proper ethic and a proper understanding of what is crime and what isn't crime to even understand economics yeah. in the first place so yes i would say ethics is definitely at the core of social organization specifically ethics applied to law which is natural law 
Okay, and what would you say was the foundation of natural law? Like, what a human, uh, a distinct human nature, by any chance? Uh, I would say that the foundation for natural law is in discovering conflict, avoiding norms. So, the law in general is saying how do we, how exactly are we supposed to deal with uh, conflicts over scarce means? Um, and natural law, in the Rothbardian sense, is saying, well, the way we deal with it is by avoiding these conflicts in the first place. So. We're not going to authorize the initiation of conflict. We're going to de denote that as an aggression and as criminal. Right. Okay. I mean, that's fair. And I mean, like, obviously, conflicts come in a variety of different forms in some respects. I'm, I'm assuming you mean uh, specifically like um, violence, like uh, like a form of um, domination over another and to trespassing upon someone's will. Maybe. Would you like to? Uh, yeah. Expound on what you mean by what, what, what would be an act of uh, violence in in this case. So uh, I define conflict as contradictory action. So it'd be something like when Crusoe and Friday are on an island and Crusoe sees a stick and he has taken this stick out of nature and he wants to use this stick for spearfishing. But then Friday comes along, tries to use the same stick for stoking his fire. This is an example of contradictory action, i.e. whoever would win they would exclude the other by necessity because it's there's a scarce means the stick either you can't duplicate the stick and have both ends satisfied simultaneously so how do you get past the tragedy of the commons in this place in this in this sense um i mean how would tragedy of a commons apply here specifically well i'm just i'm uh, like uh, it, it just seems to me that like given scarcity conflict would be somewhat inevitable to some degree unless it just it, unless it's like obviously you could see like proper governance i'm just i'm just wondering like how you would avoid all conflict like in terms of resource distribution like in a way that would necessi necessitate like a fair distribution well the the contention of ancaps isn't that it's possible to avoid all conflict uh, you know conflict uh, because we live in a world of, scar world of scarcity sorry it is definitely a possibility that it, conflicts could arise the the anarcho capitalist then says well, this is a bad thing that conflicts are rising, and so you shouldn't be initiating conflict. We should punish people who are initiating conflicts. That is, the point of anarcho-capitalism is recognising that conflicts are such a thing and recognising that they are a bad thing. Right. Well, I agree. I mean, um, it, I guess it's more of, it's more of the fact, like, I, I think that most, most systems would agree that conflicts in some respects is a bad thing um but i don't think that it's necessarily the root of all unethical behavior because it depends on it depends on what resources have been made available to an individual and what makes it their property in the first place before conflict should be resolved on one on the side of one party and the other right so like that's really what i'm i'm kind of trying to push towards like why would i let's say let's say in the case of like you know robinson crusoe why is whose whose stick is it well we can determine whose stick it is by going back to our uh root of conflict avoidance we know it would be crusoe's stick because he's not the one who has initiated that conflict it's friday who has initiated the conflict he came in he's the late comer we denote it as and um i don't agree that most systems think that conflicts are a bad thing they think that some conflicts are a bad thing but that other times we should authorize conflicts uh, the NEP is alone in being an ethic which denotes all conflict initiation as wrongdoing. Uh, I'm, I, 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 it depends on how we define. I'm, I guess I'm guessing I'm, I'm a little bit muddled on on what you would like. Because let, let's take let's take for example in the case of Robinson Crusoe. Um, he's got the stick, and I'm assuming he's gotten the stick from nature. Mm -hmm. and got it in a new spear. Now, let's say he puts the stick down, walks away, and then someone comes and picks up the stick. Have they stolen from Mr. Crusoe? Uh, yes, because assuming that is that he hasn't abandoned the stick, he might be abandoning the stick, in which case somebody else can pick it up. But if he's not abandoning the stick, then he is uh, continually in use of that stick he is storing the stick for later he is he expects that keeping this capital good around will satisfy him in future which is why he would 
uh, presumably want to keep it and, you know, maintain it and do all these things with it. Okay, so if someone comes and picks up the stick and then he wishes to get the stick back and they refuse, is he justified in initiating conflict? Uh, well, he wouldn't be the initiator of the conflict there. It That's would be the person kind of who... Yeah, yeah. With... So the other person is the one who initiated the conflict over the use of the stick. So uh, Crusoe is allowed to do anything which is necessary to take that stick back from them. Right? He couldn't go right. above and beyond, do things which aren't necessary. Right? Let's say Friday takes the stick and then Crusoe starts painting Friday's wall blue. Well, that's not really doing anything to get his stick back, so he's not allowed to do that. But he would be allowed to, you know, snatch it back from Friday or hire some uh, big muscly guys to come and snatch it back from Friday. Right. And I guess so in which case conflict's justifiable if it, well you you know self-defense is then it, it, it's justified under the premise of self-defense alone is, is in, in that respect yes right okay and self-defense encompasses one's property how does one come to own something uh through homesteading so it is you are you have a property right over some given means if you are the initial appropriator of that means or if you've traded it with someone else right so uh, how it came into being in the first place is initial appropriation which is uh, homesteading so we know that Friday uh, sorry Crusoe homestead that stick when he initially took it from nature because he wasn't taking it from anyone else so therefore he wasn't initiating any conflict over the use of that stick whereas if somebody else came at a later point and then tried to take the stick off Friday they would be initiating conflict so therefore we say that Fri that Crusoe has a property right over the use of that stick Okay, I'm going to try and, because I think the way that, if I'm understanding, I think our point of contention, because I don't necessarily even disagree with most of this, because I think it's fairly reasonable, right? It is, in this case, I would say, yes, this is his property. He is wrong for thieving it. And then uh, he is even engaging in a conflict by trespassing upon his property. Um, and then in terms of homesteading, you said in terms of initial appropriation, um, if I'm understanding that correctly, is that simply um, cl like claiming something from the commons? Um, moreover, it's um, actually implementing that uh, as a means towards some end. It is, you know, okay. actually engaging in action with that right. thing. So it has to be for, so it has to have some form of use value to the individual. Yeah, I can't just, I can't just point to something and say I own that now, right? Because I've not actually using that thing yet i am i homestead you know say a tree when i'm chopping it down i've chopped that down so i've homesteaded the action of chopping the tree down right okay okay uh, and so right we'll, we'll get onto the metaphysics of that in a second um which i find you know i, I don't have that much contention actually with that i think that the the point i would like to ask whether in this case, an individual could have, could lose property rights if they use the capacity to, um, if the, if it goes beyond their means to uh, use. So kind of like what John Locke talks about in uh, the Two Treatises of Government, that property should only extend to that which an individual can make use of. Um, do you think that an individual could accumulate so much property that they are no longer that they that they no longer that they have excess and they so and therefore can no longer claim uh that this uh that they own a given item because they have let's say uh a a, a, a redundancy of that item that goes beyond um rational expectations for well the thing is they would or for they would still uh if they're still using it then it's still they still retain the property right over it it's only if they have abandoned it that they uh, abandon the property right over it so you know you could imagine um you know i have a massive swimming pool full of gold coins and i like to swim in this swimming pool full of gold coins okay. some might say well i mean uh, you've got an excess of gold coins there and i'll be like absolutely not i don't have an not excess <laughs> uh, I, I i like to swim in them right so i'm, I'm still using these gold coins I need this many gold coins in order to swim. I like to swim in them. Right. Okay. I need to 
because there's like obviously this is we agree on a few things and i can see the disagreements kind of building between we um or at least i can see disagreements between you and john Locke here and in my case i'm probably a little bit left to john Locke in terms of property you see so if you mm. you seem a little bit right to john Locke in terms of property uh and and i don't think that's right necessary. meaning correct of course <laughs> of course um so when you say use value, you simply mean towards uh, that, that. You don't necessarily mean even in current use. It seems. Well, um, I don't really uh, implement uh, use value into my analysis of it. I just say, right? Are they using this thing? Are they engaged in this action? And if they are, then they are, and they're the initial appropriator of that uh, means. Then they absolutely are. They have the property right over it right and so like this is it, it, it i guess like there's where i'm going to come from this is that i think an individual could lose property rights or i think that an individual's property rights in the first place are, are, are a development of social cohesion rather than an individual necess necess necessarily in the first place um and i think that's obviously that's where i'm going to push back in, in when, when we go from this uh, I think that universal concepts, as they uh, develop, are um, are built from a process of psychological recognition, which uh, respects the interests of all parties. And so, if the interests of any given party are not being respected, then then property, uh, then the social fabric of society requires a material equilibrium to be established. So that the law can be upheld um or to prevent tragedy if you will right um in the case of with you saying something um as a state of use one second i'm just gonna i'm just, I'm just gonna ask someone to turn that beeping off um sorry it's just doing me head <laughs> no um uh, thank you oh yeah all right no problem thank you um okay sorry so just lost my train of thought so if in the case of use value you just simply mean towards oh sorry t of use you mean simply towards uh, you, you know um appropriating an object um uh towards some sort of given end yeah yeah right and that end can be established from where? Like, what? what is a justified end for appropriating an object? Is there a... Or, well, or, or... any uh, non-aggressive end, certainly. Because you could uh, justify any non-aggressive end, whereas you couldn't justify an aggressive end. You can So you would argue that you can justify any non-aggressive end? Yeah. Okay. I don't think you can. That's the point of contention. So what would be an example of a non-aggressive end which would be unjustifiable? Um, I think that you can disrespect yourself, for example. You could um, you could appropriate a spear to kill yourself with or something. I don't know. So, um, well, you could have, you could definitely... Um... So why, why do you think that would be unjustifiable? I don't know if we've got the same notion of justifiable here um i would say that it would be irrational because you wouldn't be able to um uh you wouldn't be able to produce a valid argument and the way the reason you wouldn't be able to produce a valid argument is because you need um one um i would say that the way that our the way that logic functions is based on a teleological activity uh, and that requires a active consideration of of a drive and interest in the first place if we aren't actually considering um our freedom and the expre expression of our freedom then we can't act rationally and i would say that that you know i'm obviously i'm I, this sounds obviously very assertive right now rather than um expounding upon this because it's there's a lot behind this that i think i need to unpack um but i would also say that you need a mutually a mutually 
uh, a state of mutual psychological recognition so that you could gain objective knowledge of yourself. And I think that without that objective knowledge of yourself, you, you can um, act in caprice in a way that is contradictory. You're trying to achieve some sort of good, but you're actually achieving a, a, a bad. So um, I think it would definitely be unethical for you to kill yourself, but the relevant question as it pertains to law is whether or not anybody's allowed to do anything about it, you know. So could somebody come and take the stick from you? And I think similarly, it would be unjustifiable for anybody to come and take the stick away from you. Right, this would be if they tried to justify such an action, they would find themselves in contradiction. Because they would be themselves in contradiction. So um basically argumentation they, they'd have to be justifying it argumentatively right that's uh what i'm meaning by justification and argumentation doesn't exist in a normative void there are certain norms presupposed when you engage in an argument and one such norm is uh non-aggression right you it's not a valid move in an argument to start aggressing on your opponent it would be like if uh, we were to have a disagreement right now and i would say right if you don't start agreeing with me, perspective philosophy, I will start beat you. I will beat you until you're bloody. This would clearly not be a valid move in an argument. I would instead just be trying to coerce uh, words to come out of your mouth. You wouldn't actually be engaging in true dialectic with me because you wouldn't be able to respond how I don't want you to respond uh, under threat of being beaten. Okay, so right, I think that's a good place to take this. Why yeah. would it be wrong to force me to do like to try and overpower my will in this respect? Uh, well, I couldn't justify it because I, I couldn't possibly argue for you to do something that you don't want to do. I couldn't say, uh, perspective philosophy, uh, here are some valid reasons why you should allow me to uh, coerce you into agreeing with me. Uh, you know, if you, because if you agreed with those reasons, then suddenly you would be in agreement. So it wouldn't be coercion anymore, right? Yes. So what if uh, in an equal case, you could have, like, how do you feel about slave morality um, in that respect? So if I was to turn around and say, whatever you say is right. Well, then you're still in agreement, right? And, you know, I'm not, I think you would potentially still be engaged in an argument, right? Because it still wouldn't be the case that um, I'm beating you bloody to get you to agree with me because you just agree with me because you want to, right? Well, let's say, like, no, but that's that, that's the contention. Do I want to? Do I know that I want to? Or am I just agreeing with you? Um, I mean, if you if you didn't want to, then why would you agree with me? Well, I might be a coward. Right, but then, because of your cowardice, you are agreeing with me, though. So you still I'm do want with to. You, that make, like, so that doesn't make you right. Right, I, I'm not saying agreement about, makes people right. We're talking about argumentation, right? And we're talking about, so if we're talking about the development of an argument and its movement towards soundness, then what we need is when we talk about the justification of an argument and, and how it actually pertains to reality, it's not about simply agreement and it, a mutual agreement upon an issue. It's about whether the issue, whether the argument is actually sound. And in the case of. Oh, I'm going to that now. Oh, damn, I just turned the chat off by accident. Okay, um... I was hoping that wasn't going to happen. I was trying to, um... Let's try to turn that off, sorry. Um, but thank you for the donation, uh, Walt. Uh, I'll answer that at the end. Um, uh, uh, basically, the... Yeah, the... The crux is... It, the reason that I am wrong for aggressing is because we need a valid argument. Now, my issue is, I think that we could not have a valid argument if I'm also being non-confrontational to a point in which I'm disrespecting myself. So certainly, maybe that wouldn't be proper argumentation when you're not actually presenting any counter-arguments, right? But the real crux of this is that we imagine that you are actually presenting proper counter-arguments. You are actually engaging in the argument. If you are actually engaging in the argument, you, we, we, we couldn't have it that we're attacking each other. 
because then that wouldn't be an argument anymore. It would be a fight. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I understand that. But equally, we need to see that an individual, an individual, like, for example, if an individual is, I'm, let, let's say an individual is like, um, disrespecting themselves to, like to the point in which they um in which they agree with another individual's property rights so let's say there is an individual who is going to kill themselves and i'm like all oh, right yeah you should do that i understand am i am i respecting them and the argument in the first place um, well, I would say you probably I... wouldn't be respecting them very much, and, you know, it's certainly possible that you could have, that that wouldn't be argumentatively justified. I, you know, uh, I haven't really looked into argumentation ethics much beyond uh, the law, but the, the real point is that, yes, that may well be something which would be a contradictory ethic to try and propose, but another contradict, but the real point here is any legal ethic which contradicts the NEP, would also be contradictory. So other people wouldn't be able to aggress on you to do something about it. Well, this is this is the thing. Like, I think, like, so for example, would you say that all, let, let's say, asylums were necessarily wrong? Or, or let's say, like, let's say you were to, let's say you were to, let's say rehab or something like that, forced rehab. Just uh, like and only asylums for people, and, and in the case of all asylums for people who are self-harming or in risk of suicide, would you say intervening to stop them would be necessarily wrong? Um, if they're an adult uh, in the legal sense rather than a child, because a child you're allowed to do things to them which would, if you did them to adult, that would be aggression. Like wow. if I had an adult there, and I was like, "Hey, you, uh, don't you um, go stick your hand in that fire," and then I start dragging them away from the fire that would be an aggressive act but if there was a little toddler there and they started walking towards the fire with their hand out i would be allowed to drag Why them would back it just in the case of the child and not the adult uh because the child is uh in the legal category we denote as uh, uh, uh latent self owner so basically um they're not able to properly express their will about how they want things done uh, in relation to their care so they need a guardian, and this guardian is allowed to um, do whatever it, it would take as it pertains to them in order to preserve them until such a point that they can express their will. It's analogous to uh, you're walking home and you see a man passed out drunk in the snow, and you know this man will get like hypothermia if he's left there. You'd be allowed to call a paramedic, and the paramedics would be allowed to homestead guardianship over that person bring them to the hospital and you know get their stomach pumped and then you know when they wake up they might say hey i didn't actually want that to happen it's like well i mean now you're able to express your will so you're allowed to say that you want out of the hospital even if you might still be sick right they'd be allowed to and right. it's slightly different with the case of the adult who goes into childhood again later in their life because they would have had the ability to express their will prior like with a do not resuscitate order, right? It would be criminal to violate the do not resuscitate order because you know that that is what their will is in this sense. But with children, their will is unknowable by virtue of them being children, right, from birth. But I mean, like, you can have a child that is capable of communication by the age of 10, but would still say that they're not capable of willing for themselves, right? Yeah, so just, you know, saying words isn't quite enough. There are, so we still don't, I don't think anybody thinks that, you know, a 10-year-old is really... What makes them capable of expressing their will? Well, because they just don't have enough mental development, right? They're just not... They, they aren't capable of understanding the world enough to express their will that? over their own care. So how do you judge mental development? Sorry? So how do you judge mental development? Uh, I imagine psychologists do it all the time. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can't just say, like, oh, uh, you know, in terms of, like... Like the insane person, perhaps, who's going to self-harm. They're an adult, capable of acting in their own volition. Right, but that, that's that's what I was getting at. With the, with the adults, if it is the case that they are not truly capable of expressing their will, then they are a child in the legal sense, in which case you are allowed to 
prevent them from harming themselves. But if they are able to express their will, then you're not. Uh, I'm, so not can... I'm not. I'm not. I. I'm not like so giving the that. specific uh, sort of psychological argument here. I'm just giving the legal argument because I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know That's whether fair. it's the case that uh, suicidal say... people can express their will. I wouldn't say it's psychology a lot of the time anyway with some of the things that we've been descri this, uh, describing I'd say it's probably philosophy of mind anyway like what, what's considered like a rational um, like, like a rational individual mm. capable of expressing their own will like what do we define as rational and why and I think that's the point of contention I think that an individual who's that the only way that we can define rationality is in respect to the expression of freedom um in the interests of the party involved if an individual is um actively undermining their interests or actively like when you actually describe natural natural law that's probably the best way to go about it in many ways when we talk about what is the form of the individual the universal which the individual can be understood as and their interests can be reflected against and we can have a notion of good or bad against them right are they performing a given function correctly then we gain the possibility of being able to see whether they are actually uh rationally expressing their quote-unquote natural function if you will um and and that would be where i think this debate needs to go because in the case of the child you agree that there is on the case of the child you agree that they are they lack the faculties necessary to will for themselves um i think that this can this uh obviously can be broadened adults and we agree in terms of mental illness and mental capacity now in terms of the law what we judge an individual how we judge an individual's uh mental capacity like how we um judge um someone as being responsible for their actions i think it's diminished responsibility i think in the uk isn't it um, um, I think something like that. It's um, and you can make it. You can actually make an um, like an inability to exercise self control. Um, uh, and, and there's there's a whole there's a whole lot on it, right? Yeah. And in 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 ba in basic terms, there is. Necess there is conditions in which we would expect that any rational being shows respect for themselves and others i would argue um before they can be considered rational they are considering uh their own interests and they are engaging in such a way as to take on board the judgment of others um and the interests of others but specifically the judgment of others i think is vitally important and i would argue that if the material conditions uh, uh, yeah that if the material conditions of of an individual have reached a point of severe deficit and you are able to remedy that deficit without placing yourself in harm's way let's say you know you have water there uh, you have a bountiful amount of water and they have no water and you're in the desert that your private property rights would be dependent upon your respect of their interest prior to you being able to claim ownership of the water right so then i given that um point i don't think the point of contention is merely down to uh what we consider actual expression of will um because it sounds like, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like if you're saying if there's someone who's destitute, uh, they have very low material conditions, you know, they might be starving or whatever, and I have a bunch of food, then would I be in some way obligated to give up some of my food to them? You would be. Um, but I would say it's the expression of will, because I would say that just as, they, I wouldn't differentiate the substance of one individual from another. Um, so I wouldn't say that you are necessarily different and that your will is necessarily distinct. Um, and you are an objective subject, if you will, before you are a subjective one. Well, in, the, in this case, objective, like, or it's subjective. you know, in the case of the adult who's passed down the side of the road, 
just because the fact that they've passed out, that doesn't mean that you're allowed to start taking resources from them. Like, I couldn't go to the guy's house and start taking money to pay for his right. medical bills. No, but uh, you're, you're entitled to uh, ring an ambulance. You yeah. Know. But, you're entitled to, to act, in, uh, act in accordance with his care. But then how is that acting in accordance with the supposed person who isn't expressing their will, who has a bunch of food, and they're standing there not giving any to the starving person? How, are, how is it acting in that person's care to take food from them? Because I would say that the individual is mistaken in thinking that they shouldn't consider the other interests, the interests of the other. I mean, you might think that they're mistaken, but how is it acting in their care to then take stuff from them? Because if they... For the same reason that it would be, it would be right to stop a child from putting a fork in a plug socket... Uh, because there are, if an individual's reasoning is flawed to the extent in which they are acting in self-contradiction, then preventing that contradiction would be an act of their care. Well, it's, it's not just preventing contradictions. Like, I wouldn't be allowed to uh, slap a person when they're about to violate the law of non-contradiction, right? They'd be about to contradict themselves, but I wouldn't be allowed to stop them from contradicting themselves. The difference it, between, with, with, uh, the, with the difference child, the right? Material. Uh, then versus uh, like concrete material uh, action, and uh, and there is also um, the the activity of the individual engaged to stop them being non-contradictory as well. So if we're acting in a way which is logic, like to slap someone from being contradictory because contradictions could lead to uh, a disrespect of that individual's interest, then slapping and slapping them is a disrespect of that individual's interest then you are trying to stop them from being contradictory by perpetuating contradiction. So I would say is this is just a perpetuation of contradiction in that example. Right, and similarly, you are trying to stop this uh, person with a bunch of food, Daddy Warbucks. You're trying to stop him from maybe contradicting what he ought to do by robbing him, right? And But that's a contradiction because you, you can't... It's not, rob it's not robbing you, you couldn't. Well, it is robbing, though. No, it's not because private property is dependent upon mutual um respect and if he's not if he is incapable of mutual respect then he is incapable of engaging with the law in a meaningful way that's the problem he's the one that's undermining the law um i, I disagree that private property is based on mutual respect it's based on conflict avoidance why is conflict avoidance wrong uh, because it's a contradiction to try and argue in favor of conflict initiation and so sorry we, conflict uh, avoidance is good Right, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, sorry, I, I, you I, you were answering the right question. Yeah, but when you when you thought you know, like, as in, why is it good to avoid conflict avoidance? Yeah. Uh. So right. So we respect private property, and the reason why it's based in conflict avoidance, uh, because it's a contradiction to try and argue the contrary. Okay, and you would you would so it's is it simply that it's a contradiction to avoid to the contrary, or would you say that there is um, so w what's wrong with a contradiction? Okay, that that that, that might make it easier. So the reason I mean contradictions are just falsehoods, right? So to try and propose an ethic which is contradictory, it must be a false ethic. So its negation has to be true. Agreed. So any pro proposition of a false ethic is what we are trying to avoid with the non-aggression principle in this respect. Uh, not the proposition, we're trying to... Basically, if I were to try and propose an ethic which said uh, it's fine to engage I in... Have, I, uh, just I didn't mean to equivocate there, but yeah, I mean, uh, like, uh, like, propose and like, a, and like not necessarily... Um, I meant it informally. Um... When you say proposition, I just meant it in, like, normal, natural language, not necessarily logic. Right, but, I mean, still, so, like, we're not we're not saying that it's a crime to try and propose a contradiction. We're saying that it must be the case that it's criminal to engage in aggression, because if you try to propose an ethic which said that aggression is good in any case, then you would contradict yourself. Uh, because and, you would be violating a normative presupposition of argumentation. I would agree, and would say that the law is in order to prevent the actualization of contradictory ethics in this respect, then. Right, meaning that you wouldn't ever be allowed to aggress on anybody. 
but it would be aggression. Meaning, mean yes. I mean, that, I would take agree. the sandwich from the, the guy. But we define aggression. So if we define aggression, you see, I I think what you what you would consider aggression in this consider in this state, I consider um, self defense. Uh, well, aggression is defined as the initiation of conflict. Right. I I I'm saying that the individual who claims property from which they, uh, without the consideration of another is initiating a conflict at an ideological level. It, not just an ideological level, just like conflict in meaning contradictory action. When that yeah, guy with exactly. a bunch of sandwiches, when he made all his sandwiches, he wasn't initiating a conflict with anybody over the use of those sandwiches because nobody else was around. Nobody was oh, using those deny, sandwiches before him. The interest, in denying the interest of the other individual there, he is initiating conflict. What is he initiating a conflict over? Food. But he was the prior user of the food, so how on earth could he be initiating conflict over the use of the food? Because just because he was the prior... Just because he was the prior... Just because he was the proprietor of the food doesn't mean that he... That his rights... Um, are... Established in a vacuum. It's established by a reason. So, like, so for example, if I create something in the world but i do it for my own good and i ask well what is my own good i would say that the initial in this respect his initial contradictory action would have been when he made the food if he labored under the belief that it was only only he mattered or that another individual if they were to be starving would not be justifiably entitled to this food then his labor was contradictory. I mean, but he's, it, it might be that he's objectively doing something bad, right? objectively doing something immoral by keeping this food that away from people. For it to be objectively immoral, it has to be irrational. Not necessarily. I mean, he would be rational in the Misesian sense, right? He would be attain. He would be acting to attain his highest end, right? His his highest end at the moment being uh, to have a bunch of sandwiches. If you don't think that it's irrational necessarily for to, to deny an objective like objectivism like an objective ethic requires that there be a rational that there, there is a contradiction in an individual's actions when they try to achieve some sort of end which is unethical otherwise there would be no reason to say that ethics was objective well i mean i think certain ethics are objective but i don't think all of ethics is objective right and certain ethics are objective you see, this is maybe the point of contention. I think that if I'm understanding your position correctly, you would say that he's the proprietor of the food and therefore he's the sole owner of the food and his interests and his preferences are the only thing that he need to consider uh, in relation to his actions so long as he's non-aggressive to another. Well, I think he should consider other things, but whether other people are allowed to force him to consider those other things is what matters in terms of the law. So right, he's he, he, he's al he's allowed to do immoral things. Like uh, you know, you might think it's immoral to have a bunch of sandwiches and just watch them rot, but it doesn't mean that he, he is initiating conflict when he makes a bunch of sandwiches just to make would, just watch them disagree. rot. I would 100% disagree. I would say that um, we've already agreed that there is a certain level of irrational behavior from which we can intervene on in the case of the parental relationship with the child in the case of um social uh consideration of the mentally ill but, right, the, the, the real key point is the interventions you're allowed to make are those interventions which would preserve that person's will until they're able to express it and taking sandwiches from this guy aren't preserving his will you see, this is the thing. I think that an individual who's engaged in what I would consider a master-slave dialectic, my interests rather than your interests, is incapable of expressing their will without having um, pushback from the individual who requires, th th whose interests are not being respected because their judgment is not being respected. I mean, do you have like a proof for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, have you read Hegel? <laughs> no. So, um, okay, so, right. 
I mean, it's how, how do I put this? I, you know, I should, I, I don't, I don't engage in analytic philosophy, so I don't write in typical syllogistic kind of form. So I'm not going to be to put it into like a nice little syllogism in any sort of reasonable length of time. Um, but okay. I think if I go to activity, you mean if I actually just go to the toilet real quick? Yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Q&A after the discussion. Um, I don't know if um, uh, Zulu will be okay to, to be here, but yeah. That'd be fine. Yeah, that'll be all right. All right, there you go. Hello. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just trying to find me sources, but at the same time, Lord in the Books is taking its time as mm. well. I suppose um, 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 I do have one question which might move us forward here. Um, do you think it is possible for a person to will that they watch some sandwiches mold? Um, I mean, if it was in theory, like, I think that it would be, I guess you could, it, it depends on the circumstances. Like, obviously I think context is important for this. Like, obviously it depends on why they were doing it, um, you know, in that, in that respect. So, would it be possible, like, for me to just be a mean guy and to be to enjoy watching people starve and to, uh, you know, will that a bunch of sandwiches are molding in front of the starving person? 
Yeah, it would. And say that you're wrong, though. So, so that would be possible for me to will that. So if the contention is that we don't know what this uh, Sandwich Warbucks, uh, you know, true will is, then, but we know that it could be that he wants to watch a bunch of sandwiches mold, then would, what is the justification true, for preventing why, that? Why wouldn't we know his true will? Well, that if, if we do know his will, then there is no justification for having him be a legal child. So there is no, because then he is able to express his will, right? Well, no, because I mean, like you could say that an individual is wrong against the will. That, I mean, that would be how you'd say that like a, a child is incapable of expressing the will. You'd be like saying like, all right, that clearly, it's not that they simply want to put the plug the, the, the pork in the plug socket. It's that against some sort of standard, they are falling short. So you already have it's, to propose some sort of rational standard before you, in relation to that will. You misunderstand. Uh, it's it's not that we know that their actual will is to not put the fork in the plug socket. It's that we don't know what their will is. So we have to preserve them until such a point that they're able to express their will. Like with the guy the, I, I, who is passed yeah. out in the snow, we don't know what his actual will is. His actual will might be to die out there, but we don't know that. And But once we do know his will, after he wakes up in the hospital and says, no, I wanted to die of hypothermia there, buddy, then we know what his will is now, so we wouldn't be allowed how to stop him from... It's, it's more about, like, how does he know his will? Um, I assume you know your own will, right? If you're conscious. Why? Like, that's what consciousness no, is, surely. No, it's not. Why would consciousness be a, a self-knowledge? That would be... Uh, one, that would be self-consciousness, and then it would be the accuracy of your self-consciousness as an identity which actually obtains and uh, obtains concrete reality. I mean, what would it so mean I, for something to be your will if you didn't even know it? Well, that would be... So for... That which you are trying to achieve... Like, in my activity, I am trying to achieve in a formal sense the good, the right, that kind of thing. In a... And, but if you're fact, engaged in I that activity, be entirely right? wrong on what that actually means. So, in in a formal sense, my activity, all activity, is engaged towards some sort of teleological expression, right? Like the expression of some sort of completeness, some sort of um, some sort of standard in which it would be completely itself, right? It would be the 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 will that wills itself perfectly, right? The establishment of an identity which truly coheres with itself, right? Like or truly corresponds to itself, rather, right? So um, like, perfect, I, I, I'm not like uh, you know well versed on uh, that, so I don't really understand what you're saying there. That's fine. Um, I'll elaborate more. So I would say that an individual could simply be mistaken about themselves. For example, an individual could think um they really like chocolate and that they really want to eat chocolate but not be aware of a chocolate allergy but if they had have been aware of the chocolate allergy that would have radically changed the right yeah the definitely and there's an example of this uh from human action where you know some tribesmen are doing a rain dance because their will is their end is that they want to see it rain they want it to rain but they're mistaken that their means will actually attain their end but they're still engaged in purposeful behavior there they're still engaged in action. They still know what their will is. They just don't know how to it's, properly attain it. It's purposeful, but it's incorrect. So, like, for example, it would be like, uh, you can have purposeful behavior without it being right. So, like, the, I mean, like, the idea yeah, definitely. of... Like the rain dance, purpose. they would be mistaken about their action. But 100%. But, I mean, when we talk about natural law and engaging towards some sort of telos in the first place, right? Like, the idea behind that is this notion of completeness it already presupposes that there is a correct form or or, or, or or a universal which could be known in this case some form of essence from which if you were to express through activity or will through activity what you ac actually is in your interests you would complete your overall life's purpose i, th I think with this this might be stemming from different understandings of what natural law means. So I'm talking natural law in the strictly Rothbardian sense, where it's ethics applied to the problem of interpersonal disputes. I don't think natural law, uh, in this well, sense, is talking about inter inter aiming at some disputes. perfect will or something. Yeah, but I don't, what's the point of caring about interpersonal disputes if there's no right or wrong? 
to mediate them. Well, there you're applying ethics to this. It's a subset of ethics, essentially. So you're applying ethics to this specific problem, right? right so well, what should be done in this specific why, area? But what is the metaphysics of ethics in this case? Like, why should I care about any of that? I mean, you like, necessarily have to care about ethics, right? Because if, if yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, but I mean, I would agree, but like, that's because I'm going to take you down. I would go down that more Aristotelian route that while walking down a technical. But if we were looking down, let's say, a Nietzschean route, why should I care that there's someone like I just bash them over the head and my will my will takes precedence but then you're still having to care about ethics you're just proposing that well my ethic is that i do whatever i want but you're still caring about how you should live if you're alive then you have to care about how you should live somewhat but it's it, it, no no uh, yes I, I agree and i would say that this is where natural law really kind of comes from in the first place is this, that there is a natural talos uh, there is a natural talos right that's yeah. the point like it's that i'm already like because i'm alive and because i'm trying to achieve an end i'm already presupposing that there is some sort of means ends relationship which is correct or incorrect right now, but that would be ethics in general on. right not ethics yeah. as applied to this one specific area well yes but w the way that it applies to this area is obviously dependent upon the metaphysical justification which underpins that right like for example, uh, Nietzsche proposes that an individual could be wrong against their own interests if they've been indoctrinated to believe that the like that that their will is best reflected, let's say, in Christianity. And he's like, actually, you'd probably be a lot happier if you weren't a Christian. You probably have a much better time, and that you're actually just being controlled, and you're expressing somebody else's will. You're unable you're, to take ownership of your own will. They're still expressing their own will. It's just that they're mistaken about how to attain their ends but they're still expressing their own will they're just they've just been fed false information like if uh, is, if if you individual. told me that you know britney spears was going to be playing in the park in 10 minutes but you're lying to me i might rush down the park and be like oh fuck she's not playing here right but i was still expressing my will i was just misinformed on the facts of the matter Right, so if I was to ask you what makes a will or an end somebody's, what makes someone's will or end their own, right? I, I don't think you could have somebody else's will in you. It's it's just your own will. You're, you're acting. You're not acting upon other people's ends. You can only act upon your own end. Why do you think that you could not act on another individual's will? Well, you, your wills might coalesce, right? We might both, we right now both have the same end of engaging in this argument, right? But it's still, I'm still acting on my own end. I'm not acting on your end to continue what, engaging in this debate, right? What allows you to take property, what allows you to take ownership of your own will? Like, what, what makes it your own? Like, what, what establish it, it establishes it as being yours? Well, it's, Is it it's, it's what guides temporal, you, temporal, right? Temporal. Like, so if, it, like, for example, right, um, we would say, you said that a child does not know its own will. Rather, or, they or, can't or, express it. They can't express it. What about, uh, well, what about, they, so they, they know it, they simply can't express it. Well, all we could, all we could know as outside observers is that they are incapable of expressing their will. We don't know whether they are aware but of their why? own will. All we know is that they can't express it to us. But well, no, they can't. Let's say a ten-year-old. Why can why can't a ten-year-old express its will to me if it's able to articulate and communicate itself right. um, in a way that is intelligible? Um, why would I say that it is not expressing itself, like uh, its own will? Well, this is a question for a psychologist, right? I'm not a psychologist. Well, it's a question for a philosopher if you're talking about the foundations of ethics. Right. Well. Reason, if it's it? if it is capable of expressing its will, then it's an adult in the legal sense. Oh, that's that's what I'm giving you. If it's capable of expressing its will, then it's an adult. If not, then it's a child. And you're defining an adult as someone who's capable of expressing its will. Yeah. Right. So it's tautological. Yeah. Okay. Right. They see this is where I'm pushing back. I think that an individual needs to know their will and be able to take ownership of their will and endorse it as their own. So they have to endorse. So if you endorse the series of events from which would unfold from your will, 
uh, that would be how it would be your own will. The reason why children aren't uh, rational actors is because they can't take ownership for the for the consequences which would follow. They are incapable of understanding the world around them and themselves within it in to such a degree which you would consider them having the capacity to uh, see the ramifications of their own actions in in to to a, at least a uh, reasonable degree. Right. I mean, Same with someone who's insane. Right, but then what about Mr. Sandwich? He might be perfectly aware that if he keeps all his food and watches it mould, that the person who's starving will starve to death. He might be very well aware I believe that, that is, is aware. the outcome. I yeah. Would assume, I would even assume that. I would consider that to be uh, an, uh, an, an irrational ethic moving through an individual, and so they are incapable of owning themselves. I mean... It is, it is the pushback so from who the owns them? then they are a slave to their nature, like the same as a child. Right, but then if, if they don't own themselves, then who owns them? Well, the same, who owns who owns a child? Themselves. Right, but did they? Like, they're they yeah. incapable of expressing their will. I mean, you could say that they own themselves in, instead of a formal sense. Uh, like, as in, like, the, they have the potentiality within them to develop self-knowledge and express themselves. And that the only person who could own them is themselves. But uh, I would say that a lack of... Just to be clear, are we talking it, ownership in the same sense? I mean in the legal it, sense where, uh, you know, um, I own myself because uh, I'm allowed to use my own body however I like and people can't force my body to go in some way where I don't want it to go, right? Um, I mean in the sense of more of like... Um, I mean in the sense of um, autonomy. So just autonomy then. So this person who is hoarding the sandwich the to isn't in autonomous. Yeah, they're not autonomous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in what sense aren't they autonomous? They're certainly engaging in action. That's an because autonomous. They're, they're, well, no, they're, that's the thing. I'd say that their actions are um, coming from an antecedent cause rather than themselves. Uh, meaning what? So it's come meaning from somewhere else rather than rather than themselves. I so mean, they are not autonomous. So am I not autonomous when I, you know, when somebody tells me that Britney Spears is playing in five minutes and I act on this information? You're autonomous if you if you rationally act on an, on information. That's not the point. You, you're, you're not autonomous if you do not act rationally. Autonomy, freedom is reason. What exactly do you mean by rational here? Um... As we outlined this before, I would say that reason is to <sighs> right. Let's try and put this in a way that doesn't get too continental for for me chat because it'll tell us off. Um. I would say logical. Um. I would say logical judgment free of contradiction so i think that that's probably a, a decent a, a sort of decent way to go around it okay so if i am um, you know proposing that apples are red all over and they are blue all over i would not be rational in this sense sorry i i i, I don't i didn't catch that last part so if i were to pick up an apple and say this apple is red all over and it's blue all over would i yes, be right. irrational in this sense yes okay so it's uh all right we can roll with that then so what is the what is like how the kind of what 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 is the uh how does this apply to law i could say like you know what is the actual implications of rationality versus irrationality as it pertains to law, i.e. what other people are allowed to do about it. Um, as in, like, what individuals are able to to do in order to correct irrationality? Rather, rather just, what? why do we care about rationality if we're talking well, about law? A, okay, well, I mean, I think this is... I mean, I would probably go down to the point and say that this is the basis of 
justice it's well, of, 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 of epistemology itself isn't it like obviously rationality has its basis in has an has an ethical i want to say is ethically necessary for well, or is at least necessary for any ethic to actually obtain truth value in the first place because you would end up in some sort of either absurdism or something like that right where uh individuals could never actually be right or wrong in relation to any sort of behavioral activity right right um, so it, it might be from which they could be judged again it may be relevant on this like meta level of well we care about rationality in this sense because uh we want to be rational when we're trying to discover what the correct ethic of law is but i mean i'm i'm more meaning okay we found this irrational person who's saying that there's an app which is red all over and blue all over um what, what how does that change their it? legal status um well i think that this is i uh, i uh, well it, to there was degrees in which it would once it starts impeding the uh well-being of themselves and others it would lead to a uh, once it hits a certain extent it would be considered um uh, insanity right so like there's one thing about saying this oh that apple is blue and red all over fair enough uh, you know it's not having any sort of um and like in the case of schizophrenia there is um how do they, how do they define it it's uh it's a uh, it's like a behavioral it's not disjunction i can't remember what the terminology is but essentially it means uh that an individual is essentially have uh, it, life is not going correctly for them like there is a there is um active symptoms which are preventing the individual from leading a a, a, a fulfilling life right um or, or at least a life of a certain well-being or a certain standard or they're placing other people in danger they're either a danger to themselves or others right and at that point we would consider someone to be hitting a level of insanity so how are we actually like determining this you know uh, so we're saying stuff yeah, like well if, if they're impeding the well-being themselves you know if they're not living a fulfilling life or if they're preventing others from living a fulfilling life how do we actually go down and say right this person they're saying an apple's red all over and blue all over that's not impeding their lives or others but this person who's hoarding sandwiches they are how do we how do we know all right all right that's actually not that bad because that's just in relation to their activities right you can see whether this this judgment is actually impeding their activities in life whether they're actually making these judgments concrete in their behaviors i mean my belief that the apple is red all over and blue all over certainly is impacting my actions so i've I brought this apple up and said, "Look, everybody, red all over and blue all over." That's that's changing how I'm acting, right? Well, yeah, I would say that that there, there comes to a point in which it's like socially embarrassing, and it's uh, and perhaps uh, you know, not necessarily benefiting them in uh, in certain respects. But obviously, if someone's making these judgments, we would also want to ask whether they were reasoning correctly in other areas of their life, which I think is why, you know, it would maybe infect things like employment, friendships. Uh, you would ask questions of whether like these delusions are okay and i do think that we should take action upon delusions um uh, you know in my debate with um uh, nine tails cosmic fox she tried to say that uh, we should not take action against uh, delusions uh, and delusional individuals um i would say that is incorrect you know because delusions are prerequisites for worse are psychological outcomes which like for example schizophrenia um or uh, psychosis rather uh and psychotic episodes like a, 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 you could have a delusion that never results in a break from reality but you could have a delusion that results in a break from reality which would then overall impact your life to a greater extent so there is a there's one it, there is how it impacts the present moment and then there's two how your reasoning itself is functioning in relation to how you're going to continue onwards through your life. So, would you actually be allowed to prevent people from uttering these contradictions? Um, would, I be, would I be allowed to... Sorry, would I, would I be okay with people uttering the contradiction? Rather, would, would I mean, other yeah, people I mean, be... I, I would other people be criminal in stopping them from uttering these contradictions um in uttering them as in simply expressing them um yes 
um, but they would also be wrong for not chastising them. They would not be respecting the reason of the other in not calling them into uh, question. Um, what about just acting in some immoral fashion? We know uh, that uh, you're not criminal in, at least under your proposition, that you're not criminal in preventing the immoral action of the sandwich holder, but are you allowed to prevent any immoral action? Um... Well, I think so, to certain degrees. I think that there are... Uh, uh, the reason I would say I think so, I, I would probably argue, yes, we should prevent immoral action. Um, the, the real crux is not producing more immoral action in an attempt to prevent it, like slapping someone across the face to stop them from saying something nasty. Uh, okay, so what, what exactly, how are we determining what actions are immoral and which ones aren't because i mean let's say this sandwich guy he just don't want doesn't want to give up any of his sandwiches would we be allowed to you know pin him down and start taking his sandwiches from him the against the expression of natural will so against the nature so like so so like for example uh and i think this is if i'm honest i think this is this is actually funny enough where i was going to go uh in relation to your ethic as well because your ethic begins from a position of non-aggression when we need to ask, well, what is an aggressive or non-aggressive act? And in the case of the child, we can see it's not, aggress uh, not aggression to act in their interests on their behalf, like to not allow them to put a fork in a plug socket. Mm -hmm. It's not aggressive to... Um, institutionalize someone who would be a threat to themselves and others um, if they're insane. Well, that's the thing. I think a lot of the time, you know, we might think that they're acting strangely. Like, you know, if I uh, think that Jesus is in the walls and he's telling me to cut myself, I think I'm potentially still an adult then, right? Yeah. Yes, it's whether you're uh, like, the, and and to be fair, it's not about simply having the delusion. It's about having the rational capacity to dismiss the fiction. Just why I said when you said, uh, you know, what do you mean? Like, how do we determine this? I thought you were asking the question like, how do we determine someone's sanity? And I was like, that's a question for the ages. And you know, Foucault talks about that specifically. Um, you know, what is madness? And I think that it is. And he points towards the fact that norms and conventions, and when you break norms and conventions, you're considered mad. And that is true to some degree, right? Um, but we would we would say that, but he also points out rather that sanity is itself justified by this rejection of what he calls unreason. So you could have a delusional belief, but if you reject that delusional belief as delusional or incorrect, you are by and large in, in uh, you are by and large sane. So if you think Jesus is in the walls, talking you, telling you to cut yourself, but then you're like, no, I should not cut myself, that would be wrong, you are sane, by definition. Because you've rejected the unreason that exists within you. But I, th I think even if you truly yourself. believed it, and then you started cutting yourself, I think that doesn't that isn't enough to disqualify you from adulthood. Just believing strange oh, I, things it's and not, acting it on would those strange qualify, things. No, certainly didn't make you a child i wouldn't say adulthood but you conflated adulthood with being um yeah in in the legal I sense as in able to express your will yeah and but in that in in if, if it's just if we are simply talking about able to express your will yes i think that believing jesus is in the walls and cutting yourself is would be enough for us to say that you have lost the capacity to express your own will yeah if you start acting upon that yeah I mean, 100%. what about the tribesmen doing the rain dance? They're acting on strange beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. Are they now children? Do we need to wait until humanity understands everything perfectly before we uh, graduate from childhood? There is an institutional aspect to this. Um, and I think that, like, for example, we would equally be children to, you know, almost childlike, I think, to future generations who would have ethically progressed to the point in which we look like absolute... I mean, like, take, for example, smokers, right? <laughs> you know, like, people who 
actively act against their own interests on a day-to-day -day basis but we don't make that illegal uh there might be a future generation that thinks that's absurd like why would we allow someone to engage in some self-destructive behavior and arguably if that was like pre, pre you know you can't predict the future of rationality because you'd have to actually actualize the rationality necessary for the future you know what i mean you'd have to be able to think the future thoughts before uh, that thought in the first place in which case you would have just actualized the future you'd have you would have created the concept so it's just if we just sort of for this point in this uh, sort of exercise imagine uh, a future ethic which has been built from arguments uh valid arguments and uh, mutual recognition in a way that is institutionalized and has reduced power disbalances to a way in which actually manifests more reason uh within society and so they simply live in a better institutional environment and the law has rationally developed which i think it does i think the law does rationally develop um i think there are some points it doesn't but you know well i mean I mean it's surely if we're being natural law theorists we wouldn't say that the law changes over time rather we just discover more about it yeah i mean that would be fair to say um but yeah i mean i, I would happily say that uh, but that but the law does change in terms of the institutional codified legal, legal system yeah but i would say that those legal systems are false if they don't align with natural law uh yes but well no like they something can be true and th this is this is uh fallibilism right like something can be fallible um and you simply do not have the means necessary to have proven it wrong yet you simply haven't had the conceptual development necessary to discover the truth well it's like believing in newtonian physics you'd be right in saying that it, it is true that newtonian physics you would be right in saying newtonian physics is true at the time of sir isaac newton but now it would be inadequate. You you would actually be false in saying that, but you wouldn't have known you were false. So oh, right, but you, not knowing that you're false, I don't think that really matters. I think yeah, you know, well, and there are, there are things like we know that taxation is theft, and yet all these legal systems, quote unquote legal systems, are in the world. They are all authorizing taxation. I mean, right? so don't they're know wrong. That's, that's oh, we absolutely do. Well, that's up to, that's up to debate, and we can kind of get onto that in a bit if you want. But um. The, the the point is is that like what we the the truth is the truth is in a state of progression right like what well rather our knowledge of the truth our knowledge is in a state of pro progression right? yeah i agree it's, there it's, it's, I, yeah. but i don't think that so you could say truth, truth is, is changing I, I, yeah i would agree truth is absolute right like fair enough like i'm happy to i'm happy to concede that that's fine truth is absolute but our knowledge is progressing uh, yeah. So in that case, you could imagine a future society which has greater ethical knowledge, which would look to us as if we're children in some respects. But the the problem is that they would not be able to communicate to us our if our irrationality without taking us through the logical progression which has moved from our conceptual basis to theirs. In the case of the tribes people doing the rain dance, yes i think we could have a conversation with them um convince them to do otherwise but i don't think you could force them you can't force moral progression because you you, you would be from if you are not engaged in that institution and you're not engaged in an institutional format with people in such a way as they um do not understand and respect your judgment as equal to yours in the first place like so for example i think that there are plenty of societies in the world which are unjust right and uh, i think from what you've said you agree even in the case of taxation but to engage in a way which overpowers the reason or the 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 concepts of an institution and replaces them with your own would not be an argument you can make argue i mean don't get me wrong like if these individuals were in you know if we were but for whatever if their rain dance was going to lead them to their own deaths then then yes i do think that we have the right to intervene um if you just as i you know for example i think that we would be right in intervening in female gentle mutilation or something like that um but the or slavery right i think we're right in, in freeing slaves i think that's um 
probably the least contentious. Like the British Empire, when it was attacking slave ships, um, yeah, absolutely justified. Um, so, like, there are there are points of call in which we would be justified in preventing the actualization of unethical behavior, right? Um, so, the problem is okay. to create more ethically sophisticated agents is not possible. You can't manifest that without having dialectic. So, um, you know, in the cases of uh, female gen gen genital mutilation and slavery, I agree that you are allowed to uh, force moral progression there. Uh, but that's Easy because to... those acts are criminal. They're aggression, right? But that's the problem. Like, they wouldn't be criminal. And, like, so female genital mutilation in certain nations. Well, I, th I think it would always be criminal because, you know, natural law. And I would all agree. That. I would agree. I would, yeah, I would agree with you. Like, there is, there is the conception of the law which is correct. And I believe that there is one society that has progressed ethically further than another in this. And they're criminal, but they do not know they're criminal. Yeah. Right. The problem is, is that it's the actualization of agents who know it's criminal. That's I would say would be moral progression, right? So, like, um, you know, I suppose the crux here is when is it? When are you allowed to force this moral progression? I would say you're allowed to force it when you're being non-aggressive, right? You're allowed to stop aggressions, but you're you're saying you're allowed to force it even when it is when they are doing non-aggressive, immoral things. Well. I, I'm, I think it's about the respect of individuals' interests. Like, the reason that aggression is in and of itself bad in the first place is, is because it impedes upon the um, expression of an individual's will, right? And I think that an individual who is incapable of expressing their will uh, through reason is equally in need of intervention. For example, in a slave morality, or in uh, an act of, or insanity, or, or in things like that, that it wouldn't be an act of aggression. It would be an act of consideration. I think that an individual who is willing to starve to death to not impede the so-called, I would say, because I don't believe they are property rights in this case, but the so-called property of an individual it would be disrespecting themselves to a point in which they are not respecting the other they are engaging with either they are not showing adequate respect to the individual to actively dismiss their reasoning so would you to summarize would you say it's accurate that you're allowed to force this moral progression when people are being irrational it's not that you'll be forcing moral progression. It's that, like, there is, I'd say that there is, there, like, for example, if an individual is being irrational at an ideological level, your duty would be to meet them at that ideological level and uh, convince them otherwise. Um, if an individual is being irrational at a political level, it would again be your duty to meet them at that political level and convince them otherwise. If an individual is being irrational at a concrete level at a uh, authoritative level um you know in their objectification of the world it is your duty to uh convince them otherwise right i mean convince them otherwise that sounds a whole lot more rosy than force them to act in some certain way well, the, i think the tragedy in this situation is that if you have an individual and this is why i would say it's tragedy there needs to tragedy would be the shows a lack of development in terms of ethics made manifest within the state so if you have an individual who would let an individual die you would have one individual who would let another individual die of starvation whilst they have the means to stop it there is an institutional fault if the system does not intervene to remedy that that would force the individual to either starve to death which would be wrong or and not be considering themselves or to impede the property rights of that other individual something has went wrong at an institutional level that needs to be remedied there is a contradiction that needs to be fixed so i suppose you know what specific irrational behaviors would i be non-criminal in preventing in your view 
So there are some irrational behaviors which I wouldn't be allowed to like physically prevent, but some which I am. So like, well, what would be like the criteria set for defining which irrational behaviors I would be allowed to it's, prevent? It's based on activity. It's based, it's based on whether you're bringing harm to yourself or others. It just comes to how much you are respecting yourself and others in terms of your failed thinking. Um, it's activity. And I would go so far as to say that activity is, if it wasn't for the teleological component in logic, logic itself would not function. There is a process of logic. Logic is dynamic and changing and developing, not... Um, not we are not able to understand reality as it is we are only able to understand it after we've engaged in a process of mediation which necessitates a teleological component because we have to be actively thinking there has to be some sort of process some sort of ongoing uh unity in relation to an individual's behavior in terms of thinking in terms of thought alone so I thought it was the case that, like, is it not that all irrational behavior impedes your own well-being, right? Yeah, I mean, to some degree. I mean, like, it, but then obviously, I said, as, as I said before, there is an aspect of not perpetuating more disrespect to an individual in an attempt to remedy their reasoning. And it's also important to recognize that th that there are cases that when we believe an individual is being irrational, they are being rational. And we may simply have an ideological uh, dispute. Um, and this is where it gets messy. <laughs> really messy, really quick. Because we could have mutually... And, and Alistair McIntyre talks about this um, in his book, uh, Whose Justice Which... Ra uh, whose justice which rationality where he proposes and he talks about it briefly in after virtue where he talks about having rival modes of rationality and he actually points towards at least three rival modes dominant modes of rationality within our state alone um which are mul which are competing and we aren't necessarily talking about whether the categories that we are engaged in terms of reasoning is are correct in the first place so we're talking straight past each other and moving towards logical conclusions without understanding the basis of our logical thinking itself so you have people who would try to enforce a type of reasoning for example liberal reasoning onto let's say a humian um who uh, you know uh, who are motivated and engaged in reasoning in a in a in a contradictory way it's not that the, so, for example, it's not that the liberals are right necessarily. They can't just assert that their reasoning is correct. But they but if they assume it's correct and try to assert it, then they are being irrational. Do, do you see? Do you see the issue here? So then, th there are. This is where I think that society needs to move towards in terms to to remedy our current ideological disputes. Well, like, so. I, I'm allowed to stop irrational behavior as long as I'm not perpetuating more disrespect uh, in doing so. Then how do we know when it's causing more disrespect and when it's not? Um, in terms of uh, remedy and rationality, or do you mean in terms of... Um, because I think there is there are certain things that most rational, most rational agents actually agree on, you know, certain inferences and certain um forms of argumentation right and we can relate that and it has to relate this is why i think it specifically has to relate to some sort of universal form underneath reason the standard of logic has to exist as a logos within what we are and so we are actually moving towards a correct mode of thinking and that correct mode of thinking would be shown to actualize a certain being so if we are not actualizing ourselves as that being, then we can we can conclude that we are we are irrational. Now, the problem is in some respects, how do we understand how to not only how to actualize that being, but what that being is? And that is a question 
what is the face of God, <laughs> right? So, like, it becomes really difficult, you know, uh, and, and no doubt, like, there is, this is going to go on for a long, a, a long time, a long, long time. So it has to, like, be, you know, appealing to this underlying level, right? So I imagine... Yeah. Or some would... sort of universal form, like, a tr truth itself, if you will. Yeah, so I imagine you would say a way to resolve the irrationality of the rain dancers. It wouldn't be just for me to tie them up and give them electron meteorology, right? <laughs> no, I don't think that would probably do it. Um, uh, but to move them from where they are conceptually to a more sophisticated, to move from what's known to what's knowable would be the right way to do it. Right. Uh, it would but... be justified in tying them up because you're stopping them from dancing for their own interests, but in tying them up, you are defying their interests. You're harming them to stop them from harming themselves. So then, so you're um, contradiction now. You know, uh, so is that how we're? How exactly are we determining it'd be fine to take the food, but not fine to tie up the rain dancers? Is it that uh, you're harming them when you sure. tie them up? Yeah, the material, the material conclusions in this respect would bring bring greater disrespect to the individual who's forced to starve than the individual who allows who who would. Uh, be stolen from. Is that not an interpersonal comparison of utility? Uh, no, it would be in, it would be in relation to uh, concrete needs in terms of the continuation of that reasoning. They wouldn't even be able to continue reasoning uh, if they're allowed to die. So you'd be right. So you're be allowed to do whatever it takes to preserve one person's life at the expense of anybody else, then. Uh, not necessarily. I think that like what you have to understand is that we are talking about like the the what an individual is is a collective before it's an individual. We are a they self before a self. So it would be what is in the best interest or what is in the interest of the collective. What does our it mean for something to be in the interest of a collective? Uh, the expression of our mutual teleological goal. It would be like the unity of the of universal substance. Like what would be rational? What would be the rationally best conclusion? Yeah, that would bring the greatest respect for the telos of each individual as a member of the same species. Right, so, I mean, why is it that you're not allowed to do literally anything to preserve some person's life at the expense of somebody else? Because the reasoning why we're allowed to take food from the food man to save the starving man is because the starving man wouldn't be able to do anything after he's dead. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... It, 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 it's oh, but the whole point of the so the the point of the consideration of the reason in, of the starving man in the first place is to try and attempt to actualize um, uh, uh, a teleological goal, right? It's in respect to the form of truth, which is a state of becoming of, of perfect becoming, if you will, right? That that the perfect logic actualizing itself. If the individual, um. If you perpetuate a greater disjunction, if you will, within the teleological expression of the collective, of the unity of, of what we are, then you are perpetuating the very harm you're trying to stop, right? So if I kill two people to save one person, for example, well, yeah, I, I wasn't going to go there, but I because that would obviously be a contradiction. I'm meaning just like if somebody's dying, I would be allowed to do anything. I would be allowed to, you know, do whatever it takes. Obviously, not killing, because killing others would obviously be contradictory to try and save a person, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, there would also be a normative aspect. So you'd be like, you would... It's not that you would simply be allowed, you'd be allowed to engage in one. I think that there is an important legal limitation here uh, that needs to be considered. For example, the reason that we would um, engage in certain rights in the first place. So we'd say that, let's say, uh, you wouldn't be able to violate certain codified legal structures um, um, in order to save someone. But the, like, for example, like the whole utilitarian, you cut some, like, you know, like, take someone's organs or something, like, just 
all right, I'm going to pin you down, take your kidney because somebody else needs it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, uh, you, th you think that would be criminal to save yeah. the... Right, but why is, why is it fine to take someone's food but not their kidney? Well, okay. So one, I think that like this, there is the point of autonomy that is that that is of issue here whether the risk is justified or unjustified whether you be rational in the first place i don't think that it would actually be rational and that you would actually be expressing uh the interests of the collective in this respect i don't think that would be the case for one but two i i, I would argue that and the reason that i said like an abundance of food rather than like you know placing someone at risk of starvation like you know sharing you know, the, your last sandwich, for example, or something like that, um, is because there is, and this is where we get back to McIntyre again, there is rational and an irrational risk that I think that we need to talk about. And this is, a this is essentially the discussion in normative ethics, which leads to the codification of law. And I, I think that if you presuppose an from an individual standpoint, uh, the correct normative stance without engaging in institutions, then you are de facto wrong. You're a revolutionary. And I'm, I'm, I'm against revolution in this respect. I do not believe that an individual would be justified in seizing the property of the wealthy, for example, through a revolution. I think that would be uh, irrational because you destroy the institutions necessary. Um, well, the institutions which ha house your reasoning in the first place. So we need to maintain a level of mutual recognition to the point in which everyone's interests are being considered that individuals are you know we are trying to maximize this end teleological goal um and all the parties in you know in principle can actually um engage and understand the failure of their reasoning what i'm proposing in this case is a tragedy where the legal structure of our society is placing an individual as a alien as being alienated from the universality of the state that they're essentially exiled and they're forced to either be criminal that they're forced to be criminal in this point the uh, they either disrespect themselves or they disrespect the other and I see both as equally irrational and criminal. In which case, we would, in, 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 and, and for the for the very reasons that we would prevent a criminal from harming another, we would prevent a uh, insane person from harming themselves. Um, and, and so they're placed in a situation of uh, tragedy. No matter what they do, it's both right and wrong. And it's the duty of the state to remedy that tragedy. Ideally, um, without uh without conflict and the way that we would the, the problem i think obviously there's there's power power involved in corruption and stuff in real life but you know we'll try and not talk about politicians slimy gits um but the if we just look at it from an ideal perspective i would say in this case the legal institutions should make necessary a level of well-being uh for the market to be for the market to even function you see like simply this state requires that everyone has the right to a certain level of well-being which would make the individual criminal for not respecting that right and handing over their property um right so it would be, would you say it's accurate to say it would be an irrational risk to take the kidney, but not the food? We understood that correctly. I think it's more of, I think that if people are thieving kidneys, um, like there's a lot involved, I guess, in the whole kind of kidney thing. Which makes it really difficult because there's like obviously the fact that it would have to be like uh, it might not be successful like you know and so yeah I would say an irrational risk with the kidney uh, 
Um, I mean, it might it might not be successful to take the food as well, right? You might. No, I would I would say that you could have an ira I would say it's irrational. Like that's the, the kind of the basis of it. Um, rationality is in terms of ethics has come to a point of tragedy. It's come to a point of necessitated contradiction within the state. That's okay, so it's like, irrational to take the kidney, but not the food. No, it is irrational to take the food. It is irrational to take the food. But only, but but it's also irrational to deny them the food. Um, well, then we have a contradiction in your so yeah, theory of ethics a, here. Say, no, it's a contradiction within the state. Well, no, it's because it, you're proposing that it's that we should go ahead and take the food from the guy. That's what you're saying. Oh yeah, I would say so. I could say it's less irrational, but I'd say that like to respect to to actualize rationality to the greatest extent, then we need to change our legal structure. It's not functioning correctly. I mean, what what makes it less irrational to take the food than the kidney? Are we quantifying um, rationality? Well, in this in this case, I would say that we were respecting more rights um, of both parties uh, in the theft than we would in the denial of uh, the vital interests of this individual. Uh, how exactly is it that we're respecting more rights of both parties? through the theft than if you denied uh, the food. Because we are respecting both parties' right to life. We are respecting both uh, both parties' um, um, let's say right to well-being, um, even right to be punished for committing a crime, um, uh, which could co correct their reasoning. Uh, the right to participate within uh, a democratic state, uh, which would have all obviously been destroyed in terms of um, uh, the death of that individual. In the case of the kidney, I think that the the right to life and the right to autonomy are pretty much synonymous in the sense that the only reason that we would have the right to life in the first place is to actualize freedom. So if we totally deny the autonomy of another individual by stealing their kidney by essentially removing one of their organs uh, i think we've impeded upon their subjectivity and, and put a, put their life at risk um and i would say that would be unjustifiable um i don't think all those rights are respected between both i mean the food man will definitely be worse off without the food by his own estimation or else he wouldn't keep the food he'd be worse off but he would, right he would, so he would, his right to well-being is therefore being violated right uh Yes, but not as violated as uh, it would have been if the party was allowed to die. Mm, so his right to well-being... So how are we comparing how, how much I, these right rights to well-being are being violated? As we just look towards um, the foundations of these rights, I would say that they're, sh they're shared. When we're talking about respecting rights, we don't respect it as on an individual by individual basis. It's universal by, ne by necessity. I mean, how does that, right, how does that answer my question, though? Uh, how because are we quantifying how violated a right is? Um, in relation to the well-being of those individuals, whose well-being is... Um, or rather, the well-being of all individuals universally. So, right, so we're looking at the well-being of all individuals univers universally. So, yeah. the well-being of all individuals would be, viol would be reduced more if the guy died than if the sandwich was taken. Yeah. How, how do we determine that? Is that not an interpersonal comparison of utility? Uh, no, I, don't, I don't think it would be an interpersonal comparison of utility. I think it would be in relation to the, the substance of, of, of... I don't want to say humanity, per se, but sentience, but like subjectivity. I mean, how do we determine the well-being of everyone and determine that it would be more lowered if a guy died than if the guy had his sandwich taken? Um, through an analysis of natural law in relation to our species, like what is what is the good life for man, what is what is the good life for sentient being? Right. So how how did you do it? Um, I read a lot of philosophy. <laughs> um, well, I think that there is, I think that there is a, I think it through um, rational dialectical um, structure. So through our institutions. And through those institutions, we gain um, logical, logically established conclusions of why of what is right and wrong. 
in the case of an institutional contradiction, which is what I'm proposing, um, the only thing that we have, obviously we are going beyond um, the purely rational, which is why I said like the there is an irrationality, there is an, an, a necessary irrationality uh, within um, within this action. It's how many institutions and how vital these institutions are towards the good of the state um being the not the state as in like the government but the state as in the body of the public um and our mutual uh recognition uh in this sense so it's like am i violating the institute uh, how many how many rights am i violating here if i violate someone's right to life the right to life is a prerequisite for numerous other rights uh, and same with right to well-being in some respects in terms of property rights it, there are there are less rights that are prerequisite. There are still quite a few, but there are less rights that are um, being violated in this case. And I think that's 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 all we have to, to judge this on. I mean, it's the response there sounds a whole lot like if you were to ask me, well, uh, how do Austrians know that uh, meddling with the interest rate will cause a business cycle? And, and I said, well, we use praxeology. Right? You haven't actually given me the derivation of how the, the well-being of everyone is lowered more when the guy dies rather than when the sandwich is taken. Oh, right. I, well, I'm, I'm talking about the legal precedent of, a, of, of an individual's actions. So, like, if an individual was... If we, were to, if we were to say that an individual would be legally... For example, if we were to allow someone to die in terms of negligence, right, we would agree that would be worse than an individual thieving. And that's why we give them a variety of different prison sentences well, I, I, I'm not sure we state, would agree we on proportionality but I think we do in our state we do have a we, we have these codified institutions in which right but the, I, I disagree with the state on uh, proportionality uh, so you think that there would be you would be for example worse for stealing than committing murder I, I don't know that it makes sense to talk about one crime being worse than another crime there's different crimes I, and they I, warrant different punishments but why do they warrant different punishments? Well, because they're different crimes. But why does that? But, that, but why does a different? What makes the crime different in the sense of in terms of punishment? Like that's what I'm asking. Like what? Well, because the derivation of how we get to proportionality, it's restitution plus retribution, and restitution is determined on the is dependent on the crime, and so is retribution. Yes. Yeah, so what about the crime determines these? these factors what determines like retribution in this uh, restitute well restitution and retribution in this case uh, so restitution for the case of stealing would be uh returning the funds i'm not sure that there is a proper restitution for murder uh retribution for uh stealing would be returning the equal sum as the funds stolen uh so basically you get double back what was stolen from you um and retribution in terms of murder would be killing the person right so th that's the thing so why would we say that so why one why is this being done and two um if we're able to look to w w what what are we balancing here in terms of these actions because for example you could you could um if an individual hasn't got the capacity for example to pay back you could then you could you could then take other means of punishment but extract the no, same no they would they would they would just owe you the restitution they owe you that restitution and they have to give it to you right and right. if they don't what then they're if, what if they're, they could never give it to you what if like the economic situation means that they would never be well, able if, they, to. if they could never give it to you then you'd never get it right that's just that's just how it that's how the ball rolls sometimes it's sim it's the same with case. the case of murder you could never possibly restitute for a murder unless you, you have some sort of body uh, creation device right see so you believe that individual see this is the i think that why we're coming at this from very different ways because i think you particularize you're particularizing everything the i would say that the reason why any like all crimes are wrong for the same reason would you disagree with that all crimes are wrong for the same reason, yeah, because they're all initiations of conflict. Okay, so to the to, we, we may disagree on that part, but let's just say that if they're all crimes, all crimes are wrong for the same reason, then 
the punishment for the crime can be proportional so long as it is proportional to the irrationality done like so for example if the if, depending on how irrational like concrete irrationality of how concretely irrational a, an action was in terms of its uh, criminality then we could say that a proportional punishment would m would be measured against the restitution of reason and that's what we are resolving here we are resolving in the irrationality within the state well that's just not how proportionality works proportionality it's uh well restitution is obvious you know you obviously uh, if you've stolen something then you don't own it right so you're not allowed to keep it the other person still owns it so you have to give that back retribution is derived via a stopple you see this is i think you you seem to think that proportional means um in proportion yes but y you are making a conflation i think or an equivalence in you, you are saying that it has to be equivalent rather than proportional and i don't think that proportion means equivalence it's not it's equal in measure not necessarily equal in kind it has to be equal in kind unless they come to Why? some sort of negotiation because there, unless you can derive for me some form of punishment which isn't equal in, in kind right and then and then you'd be correct if you derive that a priori right then yeah that would be a legitimate form of punishment but so far would, all the the only forms of punishment i know that are legitimate are restitution and retribution i i i'm not even saying that it is illegitimate in this respect i think i'm, I'm calling it a question what you think is proportional but i'm gonna need about five minutes because someone's asking uh something from us so i'm gonna have to quickly do what they're asking and i'll uh be right back is that all right yep yeah um also if you want uh walt anderson said uh stupa chatted 199 he said stabbing yourself with a spear may be aggressive um how would you respond to that just while i'm gone all right sure um be right back. well i mean i don't see how stabbing yourself with a spear would ever be aggressive because you own your body so you're allowed to stab yourself with a spear as much as you want right that's pretty easy Anyway, I'm going to go take a piss whilst he's gone. Whoop. Uh, Hello, are you back? I guess not.
Sorry about that. I had a I had a household issue that I had to resolve. No worries. Okay. Um, I hope uh, you've had a nice time whilst I've been gone. Yeah, I went for a piss. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, right. Where were we? We were talking about proportionality. Yes. And um, proportionality is not necessarily a measure of quality, but of quantity. And and I I think that you can have two proportion, two proportionally. So for example, you can have two physical forces that are qualitatively different, but quantitatively equal, and they be proportional. All right. So could you give an example? Um. Okay. Um. Uh. The weak nuclear force and gravity in in theory or like i guess that would never be equal but like um i don't know like you could have uh, i don't know the yeah like uh i don't know the or, or gravity and a magnetic force right but how would we apply this then to law uh, proportionality and punishment because right. when we're when we're looking at what's proportional it's in relation to it's proportional in in terms of the um expression of a certain end right like that's the thing when we're talking about t t talos we're talking about like has an individual's subjectivity been impeded upon to a certain degree and we're talking about right violations we're like okay well these rights are meant to protect the subjectivity and the interests of individuals within the state how how much have these been impeded upon and there is and, and we do agree that there are greater violations of an individual's subjectivity than uh, others. So, for example, we would agree that murder is quant qualitatively worse than theft, but also well, quantitatively... We wouldn't agree on that. Well, most people would agree that murder is more... You are more... A murderer is more irrational than a, uh, than a thief. Right, but I are... don't base my theory of law on rationality right i've i derive this you? via conflict avoidance right but, but yeah but the reason that you derive conflict avoidance in the first place is based on rationality because otherwise you'd move to rationally justify conflict avoidance right and, and and then in this case i don't think it's possible to be more or less irrational you're either right or wrong but like why why would it like, like what well, one it's one i would say that regardless of what necessarily you consider to be the foundation of ethics there's the foundation of ethics and then there's what any given individual considers to be the foundation of ethics right like and that's one that's part of ethics right arguing about what ethics is right um and that's why we're here today you know like whether it is right or wrong to commit such action in relation to a rational foundation of uh, in terms of aggression and, uh, and i obviously pushed back and said that aggression can be um that it's not simply about aggression it can be or even like passive aggression, you could be passively aggressive in this case by um, by dismissing the interests of another, if you will. Or you could be uh, aggressive to self uh, and yet not be impeding upon another individual. Well, like, um, um, I suppose what I want to like, get here is, you know, a crime and a punishment for that crime, which are qualitatively different, but quantitatively equal. Just some example. Uh, some examples. So, um, let's say uh, an individual has lost um, from this uh, from theft. Let's say the uh, like in terms of a calculation, we could say that they would have to work. I don't know in relation or have worked to produce that wealth. Um, a certain amount of time sort of recoup re to sort of re re uh reimburse the cost they would have to work and engage their and engage themselves and subject themselves to a level of um uh activity which would impede them from doing something other than work uh for uh, let's say five months um then you could imprison someone for five months or you could make the or you could give them community service for five months no okay right so where's the justification for that what makes that what makes it You're quantitatively in... equal 
uh, to imprison a person for five months as it would be because they might just be really inefficient, right? What if the thief is way more efficient and they could give back the property? No, I mean, like there is there like is a level seconds. of um, obviously we could we could point to uh, we could point towards. I think there are certain abstract standards from which these this can be related to and i think this is what we would relate it to so what would be a so if an individual uh, you know so happens to be way beyond the norm in terms of the wealth you know the capability of wealth reduction um than the average person um and so let's say makes re recompasses the wealth in a matter of moments rather than a matter of months or years. Um, I think that we would put this against the universal subject, not necessarily the uh, the particular subject. It wouldn't simply be it would be how much you violated the state as well as the individual. So like what precedent this sets, and and for uh, in that respect, like how much abstract I don't want to use the word abstract labor because that has Marxian connotations. But how much abstract value you have um, uh, taken, or how much, uh, or how much abstract subjectivity you have uh, impeded, and that would be against the universality of the state, you know, in terms of the the, the sort of average wealth production. Right. So, um, I think if again, an there if an is, for example, is stolen from um you know you could say that there is i think there can be I, I think i would probably lean towards universalizing universalizing this punishment in terms of the ration in terms of a rational standard rather than heavily particularizing this punishment um like you know for example an individual goes to prison for the rest of their lives because the person they stole from was disabled and never, never is never able to to pay them. Uh, you know, actually able to recompense the wealth that was stolen from them. Um, uh, uh, you know, and and on top of that, I think that that would be, you know, you could make the argument for reimbursement and retribution. Find them, send them to prison, um, or find them and send them to community service. Right. So here you've. There's a snuck premise, and it's again interpersonal comparison of utility, because you're comparing the value that the individual assigned to the five months worth of work. You're comparing that to some ideal valuation, and then you're comparing that ideal valuation to the thief, right? But then you're you're still trying to compare these utilities here, which isn't possible. No, I think. I think it's against the expression of subjectivity. So if you've impeded the individual's life, so by committing theft, you we we, we agree that theft should be outlawed because it is an impedance upon some someone's subjectivity. To what degree, I think, should be calculated against the universal standard of subjectivity, the objective subject, rather than the uh, the particularized subject, which would uh, be more accidental, and uh, knowledge would be, uh, I think, would be nearer impossible in this respect. All right, but the words you oh, the words the you used there was all right the the amount of work they put in compared to this universal standard of subjectivity would be yeah. five months worth of work, right? Yeah, but that's yeah. I think I was wrong. I would say like when I first said this, I started by comparing the two subjects, and I didn't compare them against the universal standard, and that was my mistake. Right, but. Even introducing this universal standard, this objective subject, you're still comparing utilities. You just add an extra step in the middle, though. No, you're, you're, not. you're saying the amount of work right. they put right. in would have been five months worth of work for the objective subject. So therefore, whatever five months of worth of work for the objective subject would be for the thief, we imprison them for that long, right? But then. How on earth do you do any of this calculation? But I, sorry, if I if I may, like one, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing in terms of utility, and then two, if you're asking how I would make this calculation, I would say that we would. I I think that we could uh, essentially look towards something. 
how it would impu- how it would impugn the, the subjectivity of the median average subject would probably be the best way to do it or what would be the yeah in this respect right but what would that actually involve because i mean you know i could say well we would find out uh, the effects of uh you know m- muddling with the interest rate by looking at uh, the praxeologic effect of that it's like yeah that's that's how you would go about doing it be like what specifically are you doing here like how specifically would you work it out i think uh i'm not necessarily a philosopher of law for one um or a you know i'm not in the you know the crown courts and so on and i don't know um whether this would be the best way of going about it so i could be wrong uh in terms of me practical application here um but i would probably say that the best that well the only way i can think of at this moment in time would be to look towards the median weight like the median salary of an individual uh the amount of hours worked to or not necessarily hours work but like uh work done um to fulfill that um to to fulfill that uh mandate and then have that as the standard from which it's judged against right but then you're essentially saying that the utility i.e the value of the salary is equal amongst people so you're saying that yeah, utilities that are equal yeah i think that is a mistake to be entirely honest with you because it would you, you would have to be able to say that the subjectivity of the individual themselves so it would i think you'd actually have to look towards the impact upon an individual's life actually yeah so i think i was right in the first sense when i was comparing the individuals um rather than comparing it against the sort of mean standard uh, a median standard so i think that would be because this is terms of practical application like this is uh this is like um sort of institute like this isn't the, the thing that i normally do um you know i'm a philosopher typically it's not like uh the it this is more uh league applied legal theory um so i think in this case you would have to look towards because what i'm trying to balance here overall in terms in formal terms is the is the impedance of subjectivity right and if i'm trying to balance the impedance of subjectivity i think that how we go about doing that would have to obviously consider the effect on an individual's capacity to achieve a good life. So I think that ultimately what we're probably going to find, and I think that we'll probably have to implement maybe some sort of minimum standard so i think that you'd have to consider the effect on the particular individual and the effect as a precedent towards the state so you would take into consideration how it has affected the particular individual within the universality of the state so if an individual has lost more than the average then they would uh need to be reckoned uh then that would need to be reimbursed if they've lost less, you would still apply the average um, in order to respect the universality of the state and, and in terms of reason. You'd say like, your crime is has done more damage to the state than this particular individual in this case. And in some cases, it does more damage to the particular individual than the state. Um, so that's probably how I would say it. So in terms of practical application, it would be how much damage it's done to the individual's capacity to live a meaningful life a good life um in material terms in this case because it's theft and if it is let's say they're a billionaire and you've stole a fiver i would say it's probably negligible right but you should apply a minimum standard of uh, you know the harm done to the state I can, in I can see much... a bit of a loop forming here because that is still you're saying that stealing a fiver from a billionaire is 
in some way less damaging to the billionaire than it would be if you stole it from a person yeah, who is. has a hundred quid. Right. That you're still doing an interpersonal comparison of utility between the billionaire and the person with a hundred. So well, I can see a bit of a loop for me. It depends on what you mean by utility. Do you mean in terms of like, cause I, I'm thinking of this. As I, I mean, economically. As in, so just essentially use the, the, their capacity to use it towards a certain end. Yeah. Their, so their own, case, yes, they are. their own, uh, subjective valuation of it we could say right you're saying no, I disagree, that the, i disagree with that it's not subjective it would be it would be objective i mean in values relation. are subjective in economics no. yeah in economics but ec economics isn't what it's talking about half the time well that's i'm speaking economically here yeah but i mean like why you said yourself that economics in the first place it has an ethical basis and if we agree yeah. that there is an objective basis i think there is an objective right and wrong so right. when we talk about has the objective, an ethical basis but that doesn't change what value means in economics what well how are you defining value because we might be talking straight past each other then so value is essentially the ranking that people assign to different ends so if i have various different ends you know uh i want to go eat a burger i want and i rank that first i want to uh, maybe go for a drive i rank that second play some baseball i rank that third i would value going for a drive more than playing baseball and i would value eating a burger more than going for a drive right it's that's what value is it's basically the ranking of different ends and you're saying that the value assigned to a fiver for a billionaire is less than the value assigned to a fiver for somebody with only 100 quid but that's you're com trying to compare their value scales then you can't do that like marginal utility what it'd be like marginal utility in some respects wouldn't it so well like, we could we could say that the um you know thank you so much chat by the way that was actually really nice thank you sorry <laughs> i didn't think of that <laughs> we, we could say that the um marginal utility only applies on an individual level right so we could say that the billionth dollar is valued less to the billionaire than the 999 million yada right yada 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 right we could say that we couldn't say that the billionth dollar for the billionaire is worth less than the hundredth dollar for the hundred air. We couldn't say that because of how much it. How you mean? Because the the standard that you're comparing it against is, and this is why I think it's this is in terms of economics. We are looking at is the the concrete use value within the state in the marketplace, which would always be equal because money like the value of the currency would be equal to both parties. Right, this is a mistake that classical economists made. When I trade a hot dog for $5, right, yeah. uh, I'm paying $5 to the hot dog vendor and he gives me a hot dog. It doesn't mean that I value the hot dog at $5. Rather, it means I value the hot dog more than $5. It's a double coincidence of once because the hot dog vendor values the $5 more than the hot dog. That's that's what you can say. It's not It's not saying that the hot dog is equal to $5 in value. Wait, sorry, I don't, I don't know what you're necessarily trying to make the point of with that. Because, like, because I, I, you're talking I, I, about like, well, we're comparing against like market value, but that's that's a misunderstanding of what value is. But I think value is ultimately not like so. For example, market like the whole point of value in in the first place is 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 against the is against the expression of an individual's interests. Now, I think market, I think that what most economists look towards is the expression of preferences within the marketplace yes uh, preferences do uh, demonstrate what your values are that doesn't mean that you can compare values between different people money, apart from just this, yeah but money in this respect is just uh commodified preference right yeah it's a universal medium of exchange right but that doesn't mean yeah, that you can compare values price. between people like a money well, doesn't allow you to compare values between people you see i think that value is always universal anyway like in terms of ethics like and that's what economics is subject to so like when we're talking about the market it's only valuable in relation to people's lived experiences like i don't give about i don't give a shit about the market like two shits about the market if it was making people's lives worse uh, okay like that, but it's the, we still haven't got to where we can compare the value scales between a and b well this is this is what i'm trying to say here like when we're talking about comparing value we're comparing against subjectivity not against monetary loss in the first place money is just a means to an end it's it's a measurement in relation to preferences which are themselves only valuable in relation to the interests of the agent right so which why which is why i'm talking about 
ethical so, value rather than monetary value. Okay, we're so talking about what, what do you mean by well, for example, ethical like someone, value? Like, for then. Example, so when we're talking about, like, look at it like this: when we look towards when when someone commits a crime in the state and we demand that they are pay, like they pay uh, a fine, that fine is dependent upon their material conditions, right? We will charge someone more if they are wealthier. Do you think that's necessarily wrong? Uh, yes. Okay, we have a massive disagreement there because I think that needs to happen. All right, but what is the justification for charging the richer man more for a to crime? To impugn his subjectivity to the same degree. But how are, how are you determining how much the, you are impugning well, subjectivity? In relation to, to, to nature, in relation to completion, how much... How much uh, How much freedom are you taking from this individual in this how you, respect? How are you measuring that, then? Freedom in relation to the expression of rational interest. It seems so like someone, you're just kicking example, the can down the road here. Like, how am I actually going and saying, knowing how much to find a given individual? Are you asking how I would find me rational interest? I'm asking how you would know how much to find individual X for crime Y. Uh, so... I, I, so how would I? So let's say crime X is. I'll try and make it contextual. Let's say crime X is let's say like theft, and the theft um, is let's say he was stealing I don't know candy from babies. So I don't know. Let actually let's say like it, it was a it was a theft that uh, swindled people out of their pensions, and so massively. Um, impugn the subjectivity of those people who lost their pension funds right essentially they, they let's say they uh they let's say it in this case let's not let's not talk about whether it is or is not fraud let's say it has been decided that this is fraud you have committed the crime of th theft towards these people um what you would ask what about these pensions is valuable to these individuals and why you would look towards what they have lost in concrete terms of how they can live materially free lives in this case. Like concretely, are they able to express their interests? Are they going to be suffering from a lack of food, water, shelter, these kinds of things, uh, vital interests? Then you would look towards perhaps um, recreation, the possibility of having... Um, uh, luxury in this case and you would then calculate how much so you would say like okay um this individual has been disrespected to the point in which they would die from you stealing this or this individual would uh be disrespected to the point in which they would um suffer great pain uh, and material loss or that they would be incapable of sending their children to education and uh, you know, and you would, uh, and it's hard to. Um, it can be difficult, I think, to proportionally quantify these things, but not impossible. You could look towards the um, the relationship to happiness these things have um, towards the average individual, um, and you would look towards the rational foundation for these things bringing happiness in terms of ethics and how essential these things are. The more essential, the uh, and so like the greater conflict of, of reason in, in, um, in this, the worse the crime. And to that degree, you would take more. And so, for example, let's say if you stole to the point in which you were to cause someone's death, I would charge you for murder, not theft. Do you see what I'm saying? The crime now starts to become qualitatively different. Theft right. Is only if, if I kept everybody's resources away from them to such a point that they died, that's a different crime than yeah. theft. I, I agree. Yes, I, I agree. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying like there is like if we are able to say that in the first place, we have already said that crime is dependent upon the individuals and their interests. Not quite. And how that being respected. Because that is an actual 
different thing, right? You're Why if I like it... drop a cage over someone and don't feed them, that's a different thing than you know taking well, some money out of their wallet. Well, yeah, I would say it's it's a different form of of murder in this respect or manslaughter, actually. Yeah, but like just talking about theft, you know, stealing a fiver from a billionaire versus stealing a fiver from a hundred air, right? Do, Those do, are both but, theft. But, they aren't on, do you qualitatively see different. But do you see how the qualitative difference is dependent upon the quantitative denial of subjectivity? Like, all that is being done in human life is the same. We are trying to will. So if how much that will is impeded, there is only one quality in this respect, and it's the will. Right, it's, quantitatively I, it's only qualitatively different in, the, in, in terms of how it's being made concrete in... I, I don't think it's possible society. to actually measure how much you're impinging on somebody's will. Well, I, I think I think the we can in terms of how much respect for their well-being uh, you've given them. So I think if you are not respecting them, if you, if, for example, if you are not giving their need for food, water, and shelter consideration, you are holding them in a lower regard. You are rejecting them and the state more. Than if you are rejecting, let's say, their um, luxury, their, their right, their right to uh, recreation. Uh, okay, but how are we actually a greater amount of irrationality? You are categorically rejecting the other other's value to a greater degree. Right. Okay, so, like, but how in terms of proportion, how value you think, how valuable you think you are to them as a ratio would be the qualitative qualitative difference of a crime so how and valuable any, and, and the, the the this would be basically i would say why justice is holding a scale um because it's about making equal the the valuation of both parties both every individual is necessarily equal to each other you see making equal the valuation yeah so how how have you how how have you valued others in your concrete reasoning, how have you treated others in terms of value? At what point value would you... Value in what sense? As in their interests versus your own. Because this is sound... I'm, the, the loop seems to be starting again. So perhaps we should move on, because I'm going to say trying to equate values like this. But it's about interest. It's not necessarily about, let's say... like So it's, it's about like, are these individuals capable of happiness and why does their happiness matter than your more than your happiness right it's not I, necessarily utility in terms of mere pleasure it's about the it's not about how much is in the cup it's about the cup to to kind of quote tom Regan. Like, even even talking about happiness i think still happiness is subjective i don't think you can compare happinesses between people i'm not saying necessarily comparing happiness in the sense like like Wait, wait, sorry. You, you, it depends on what you mean by that. Do you mean, let's say, the the quality in terms of? Because really, ultimately, I'm going to basically say freedom. How much freedom do these individuals have? How much respect to their uh, their rational ends have you given them? So, if they, like, for example, your your right to water, food, and shelter is equal necessarily to somebody else's, would you disagree with that? Um. Well, I mean, we. I don't think you have a right to water or shelter. Okay. Unless you own it. Right. Well, I, I would. And I would say that your right is necessarily equal. So how much you've deviated from that in terms of how, w what preferences you would have put before that right, it would determine the inequality of consideration you give others. If you necessarily reject them to the highest degree then that's what a murderer is. They, so if, if you kill for fun, right? Well, if you've committed pre premeditative murder or your own sick enjoyment, that is a greater rejection of rationality than if you've committed... Um, uh, was it like... Rec was it... What's it called? Like involuntary manslaughter? Is it, is, it a volunt is it involuntary manslaughter when you run someone over with a car when you're drunk? Uh, like, and yeah. that's why the crimes are different. Because it's how irrational your behavior was. Like, how much you considered the other in your actions. That's well, what you're being punished for. I would say 
they are different crimes, manslaughter and murder, but the reason is because manslaughter lacks mens rea, i.e. you didn't have a guilty mind. You weren't deliberately doing the crime. Wait, no, no, you, you did deliberately do a crime. You weren't deliberately uh, committing the act of murder. Like, you weren't deliberately killing them. You were committing a crime which led to their death, which is like, you would have... Uh, it, that, that, that's why you would make the distinction that's otherwise it would be an accident you wouldn't be going to prison at all um you've you've somehow broken the law right you've well, reckless engagement can still like be criminal right if yeah accidents can be criminal if it's criminally negligent well not even if it's just criminally negligent if i'm uh walking along and i step on someone's sunglasses that they had just dropped that's still criminal i still got to restitute them for breaking their sunglasses but they couldn't take a pair of sunglasses from me because i didn't deliberately break their sunglasses. I don't have a guilty mind. That's not a crime, man. Why would you think that was well, a it's crime? it's absolutely like, still a crime. If someone drops their sunglasses... Uh, so if someone, so you're saying, let's say, if someone dropped their sunglasses and you're walking along, so if someone drops their sunglasses underneath your foot and you step on them, you think that's a crime? If, if they just dropped them and they were going to pick them up and then I stepped on them, yeah. Intentionally? No, no, even if I wasn't intentional. So if you just accidentally stepped on someone's sunglasses, do you think you've committed a criminal act? Yeah, this is the distinction between oh actus God. reus and mens rea. No, man, that's not... Well, that's it's, not it's absolutely... Criminal. Like, I mean, you can Google it. Actus reus and mens rea. I haven't made these terms up. I'm not saying that you have made these terms up. I'm just saying I've never heard of anyone being prosecuted. For example, like, you don't hear about people being prosecuted when a child runs onto the road and gets ran over uh, if they're going the speed limit and the child and they had no opportunity to stop. I mean, state law is very... Uh, well, I mean, in that case, it would depend on the rules of the road, right? If the child is violating the rules of the road, yeah, then... Yeah, because about breaking the law. So yeah, if, you, but, if like, you have no intention of breaking the law, let, and you are not breaking the law, then you've not committed a crime. Let, let's, we're say, about let's, say I'm, let's say I'm walking along, and I'm not really paying attention, and then I accidentally step on someone's rose garden, and I break some of the roses. Yeah, so right? if you've walked off the path, then yes, you've committed a crime. Yeah, but I didn't intentionally. I didn't say yeah, I, I hate those roses and I'm going to pull them all out. Yeah, I would agree that would then be a right. crime. You've that, that's that. criminal, but not it's not yet. deliberately criminal. I agree. So it's actus reus without it's mens negligent. rea. It's negligent. You haven't followed the law, but you didn't do it intentionally. You didn't right. break it intentionally. That, that's that's the distinction between actus that's reus the, and mens so rea, and that's between, why manslaughter and murder are different crimes. Yes, which is exactly what I said. But if you drop your sunglasses on the floor and then someone steps on them, then no, they don't owe you anything. Well, that's that's analogous to the rose garden. No, it's not. How not? Because if you've dropped your sunglasses on a public walkway, for example, and the individual public? didn't have the opportunity to stop and didn't intentionally step on your sunglasses, then your your accident has led to a continuation of the breaking of the sunglasses, which right, is maybe, not... Maybe they did have an opportunity to stop. Maybe I'm just really slow at bending down. To pick up my sunglasses, someone's jogging along, and then they jog over my sunglasses. Right, and then we'll be talking about whether the individual was responsible. Well, how much? Uh, I mean, this would de obviously depend upon whether we would consider an individual responsible for uh, stepping on, let's say, sunglasses um, on a public walkway, um, and how aware they have to be of other people dropping sunglasses to a reasonable extent. I'm willing to bet that more states would consider that to be non... Like, at one, I think you you probably wouldn't even be able to go to small claims court for that. It would be that much of a joke. But, like, I think right. that... That's the thing. You, I, you, I disagree with that the state law is correct law. I'm giving you correct law here. That's... Uh, no, I, I completely disagree. I think that's incorrect law. Why do you would, why would you say that the individual has the responsibility to look down on the floor in case they accidentally step on someone's sunglasses? The, the person still owns those sunglasses, right? So there's still being a conflict right. initiated over the use of those sunglasses. And the person who initiated no this conflict yeah, is the person who stepped on about the use of public property, not necessarily the use uh, of the Public sunglasses. property. You've used that term a few times, but I don't think there is such a thing as public property. Okay, you, okay well, I, I would. I would say that common property, like as in, or at least... Uh, so you think that the, in terms of, let's say, a public walkway, that's... I, I, would, would, yeah, um, I, I don't think it's... There is such a thing as public in proper law. I think someone had to make problem. the walkway, you know, either they own it or they, maybe they abandon it. What state happened? owns it in this case. Ooh, I don't think the state owns it. Uh, I, I would, like in terms of a... State, state's another. a gang of thieves writ large, as they say. I would disagree. I think that the state can be a rational, rationally justified 
uh, institution. So how exactly would you rationally justify the state? Um, I would say that it would be the embodiment of the subjectivity of all the individuals involved. So In... like it would be rationally defending the interests of the universal subject. So the state is the embodiment of the subjectivity of all individuals under yeah. it, right? Um, what does that mean? It is the institutional encoded, uh, it is um, the embodiment of institutional rationality um, in terms of uh, the codification of law and its enforcement. So institutional rationality as it pertains to law. Well, yeah, it'd be the production of law and its enforcement, yeah. No, but pertains to law is fine, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure what institutional rationality means or even how to apply uh, well, to law. I would say that rational, rationality can only be institutional. I'd say that through mutual recognition, um, through um, uh, the um, mutual engagement towards certain ends as uh, equal equal parties, which leads to like an, an institution. And those institutions are housed within the uh the 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 society as at large which which is encompassing all institutions it is a, it is simply the the balancing of all institutions if you will in a, in an almost an aristotelian sense if you if you look at how he talks about that in the nicomachean ethics um i suppose we could use this as a segue into something you said earlier where you said legal institutions should make necessary a given no, level of well-being. Before we before we do that, I think that it's important to recognize, that, let's say, like the legal distinction between, like for example, between various crimes, and um, and the punishments and what constitutes a crime. Because uh, it seems to me that you want to say what constitutes a crime is simply the something like the loss of property for an individual or well, the initiation of conflict but the, the if the conflict well it'd be whether one whether the individual who commits an accident is initiating a conflict if they couldn't have done otherwise well they absolutely are um i, I mean if i think if they go beyond the confines of the law of what would be reasonable for them to, they, to they commit, are going beyond the confines of the law by initiating conflict the conflict, yeah, but that's self-justifying. If you say they are initiating conflict, then I say why. Well, so it's and not self-justifying. It's justified by well, argumentation ethics. I, no, I'm saying that I think that it's 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 self-justifying in the sense that if you are if I say what makes them initiate the conflict, and you say because they are breaking the law, and then I say no, what, what makes them initiate the conflict the is law, what makes them initiate conflict is the, the fact conflict. that their body is moving forward and their foot is coming down onto the sunglasses. That's what makes them initiate conflict. Right, so activity itself is an initiation of conflict. No, 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 not all action, right? Action well, which... Only action which causes ha material... Contradictory benefit. action. But it's not contradictory. There was nothing contradictory in that It action. is contradictory action. Uh, the person How with the sunglasses... Con what is the contradiction in their action? The person with the sunglasses wants to use the sunglasses for something other than being stepped on. The person who, who is stepping on the sunglasses wants to continue stepping forward. Right? It's contradictory so action. Contradictory the, the use of the sunglasses by one person contradicts so, with the use by another person maybe the contradiction could you not say that the contradiction was the person dropping the sunglasses onto a public walkway no because you're allowed to drop your sunglasses you're allowed to do yeah. that and you're also allowed to run on a public sun uh, on a public walkway you're not allowed to run always like if somebody was uh lying down bleeding out and i ran over them and stepped on their throat a bunch Agreed. right so, uh, that would, yeah. that would i'm not always allowed to run forward right but well, i am allowed to drop my sunglasses uh, yeah and we can talk about whether someone had, and this is why we mentioned in this, whether someone had the opportunity to stop and whether they intend and intentionally stepped on the sunglasses. Well, that's the thing. They in didn't intentionally example, step said, on them. They don't no. have mens rea. Yeah. So we said they're not intentionally stepping on them mm -hmm. and they didn't have opportunity to stop. Whether they had an opportunity to stop or not is irrelevant. It is not irrelevant. They, they certainly had an opportunity to not run out the door that day, right? Okay. And you think that that, precludes i think I, I don't understand how you necessarily like you also had the opportunity not to buy sunglasses i don't i don't right under, like, like they are trying <laughs> so to there, use there, the path. there there were yeah they are trying to use the path so they want to use the path they, for so, moving like, forward the path. and they're moving forward implies them stepping on the sunglasses which is criminal 
your 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 sunglasses are getting uh, getting in the way of my ability to use the path. Okay. Like, at, at what point do we consider? Well, you which could have part stepped around them. If, if they had no, but that's the point. They my could eyes not aren't that big. Them. You said that's why I said if they had no opportunity to change. But then you'll say they, they step around they them. But they, they couldn't step around them because they, they had no opportunity to change. That's right. the point. Of they physically, the, they physically were able to step around them. They just weren't aware, right? So they didn't. Okay, but it's uh, uh, what? Yeah. So that comes to the point of uh, how much? Uh, well, one, I said no opportunity to stop. Right. So that whether what, they could what do you, what do you step around them or not is questionable in that because that was not precluded in the like they they the aren't being stuff. forced forward by some spirit or something. They physically are capable of stopping. It's just that they aren't well, no, aware I mean, that there's I mean, some obstruction in, in the way. Like actually, like you can't. It's like unless, unless, like you know, uh, I don't know. Like for whatever reason, like the laws of motion just didn't suddenly stop. You can't. You there is stopping distance. Like you, you can't just just tumble backwards and like or, or just immediately stop. You can. You can choose where to put your foot down, though. Well, depending upon the momentum you're actually going, like that's the. The question. So, if you're going at, let's say, even a reasonable momentum, you're going to have a stopping distance. I mean, right. this is you can, as you're stopping, you can still choose where to put your foot down, right? But that's that's the point. It's physical. Oh, yes, which is which they, is they depends upon. It's not some physical law of nature that they have to it, step it, on it, these sunglasses. It, 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 it's it's just, just that they it, weren't aware of the sunglasses, so they ran oh, over them. They, no, no, like that's the point. Like we we didn't even necessarily say that they are or not. Well, they said that they are not aware in the sense that they're. They're not intentionally stop stepping on them. But even if they became aware at the point in which they are now committed to putting their foot down, yeah. you don't think that, that's at possible? That, at that you point, that's, that still not, that's still not mens rea. They might become aware right before their, their foot is like a millimeter away from the sunglasses. Yeah, and then suddenly like, they become aware, oh no, I'm about to step on these sunglasses. Right? That's the point. Yeah. They they that's the whole that's the whole reason. That's the whole point, is that they didn't become aware at such a point where they could have avoided doing it, right? No, that's why that it's they, not mens rea. That's why it isn't mens rea. The fact that they didn't become aware soon enough yeah, to I actually agree. not do it, I mean, that's why somewhat, they don't have a guilty mind. Not, not, necess not necessarily, because like you could you could say that someone's committed a crime, obviously. We would agree that someone can commit a crime involuntary. Yeah. Like, uh, like you know, like, to, to a certain degree, as in, like, they... Uh, they they uh, committed to a series of ev of events, which was uh, breaking the law mm -hmm. at the point of committing them. For example, a drunk driver. But if you're jogging down the street and you're running along, and let's say you um, become a let's say you're running along, you don't see the sunglasses, right? But let, let, like and and you go to um, just run as usual. The question is. Whether you, if you could not act otherwise, like if you could not have acted otherwise, and you are not breaking the law in the action you are doing, that is a pure accident, and you are not well, liable. That's the thing. I, I do not see how you can argue think, for liability. I don't there. think anybody could ever have acted otherwise because you can't change your, your values are given, right? I don't think I could <laughs> have chosen not to debate you today. Oh no! You certainly could have. Like you don't I, even free will. I, I'm physically po It was physically possible, but my valuation always would have been such that I would have chosen to debate you. Why would it have always been such? You could have reasoned differently. Well, how on earth could I have reasoned differently? You could have contemplated it more. How how would I how would I do that? Because I the reason more why more. the reason why I didn't contemplate more. more. The, the reason why I didn't contemplate more was because I didn't want to contemplate more. How could I have made myself want to contemplate more? So you think, so you think that you are, ne so you would argue for a kind of determinism in an almost Tropenharian sense. Like I almost, I, I cannot will what I will. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I disagree with that. I think that you, you that I think that the will of the agent is necessarily autonomous. You do manifest your own will. But how could I have physically chosen to not debate you today? It's a choice. That's what the will is. It's it's it, to to say that right. you cannot will. But the you reason will. why I chose to debate you is because I value debating you more than not debating you, right? But you but that value is in and of itself a choice. Right. Everything's but, a choice. But how could I have decided that I valued something else different more? By choosing, by use of reason. But how? Right, so I would have had to choose to reason about it. But how could I do well, that? You are reasoning, and you could have reasoned differently. 
I mean, my reasoning brought me to valuing debating more than not debating. Do you think that there is an antecedent cause to your reason, or do you think that you are the cause of your reason? I I don't know, right? It's it's just that I I did re I did go through the steps of reasoning. I don't see how I could have chosen different steps to the reasoning. Well, because the, the, in the steps that you've chosen during your reasoning, like the way that you they as in as you've engaged in reasoning, you might have one you might have engaged partially. You might have made uh, choices in relation to uh, how much time you're going to spend thinking about certain things. You've made choices throughout this whole process. You could have made different ones, which would have given you more or less time to reason, even if the faculty was uniform throughout the, the process. I, I, I just, I frankly don't know how on earth you could show that I could have made different choices. You're still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, right. So it's because you're. <laughs> so this is like a com you're, you're arguing for a kind of like um. Um. You're arguing that the reason that you are doing is concrete, right? And it and and because it's been made concrete, that is the form that it must have necessarily took. Right, that that psychology that you've engaged in, the way that you've thought and chosen to be, who you've chosen to be, at that given moment, is the choice that you could have made that could have made you reason differently. You could have chosen to be someone else, but right? I, you could have chosen to be and act differently. Right, but that's the thing. At each given choice, I make the choice based on my scale of values. I don't think. I could have made a different choice because I would have valued it the same. It's like, you know, I value doing this debate more than not doing this debate. I don't think it makes sense to say that I could have valued it differently, right? That's That just isn't how I valued it. I did value. No, I think you could have valued it differently. Like, like for example, like, it, because you could have, un, you, you, for example, it's how much, it's not just simply how much you value, it's how much you've chosen to value certain aspects of your life and who you think you are. And it's your self-belief, in this case, that is shaping your world in terms of representation. You you could have chosen to represent the world in a different way. I'm just going to Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer. I mean, what, what does it mean to choose to represent the world in a different way? Well, where do you think your representation comes from? Like, where do you think that representation of the world comes from in terms of, like, objectification? I mean, I imagine it comes from my mind, right? Yeah, and where does you, like, in... Are you in control of the faculty of mind, or do you think that something else is antecedent to that in terms of your reasoning? Well, I'm I'm in control of my faculty of mind, but how I choose to represent the world, I'm going to do that based on, you know, what I value more, right? I'm always acting to raise myself on my scale of values. But we're talking about, let, let's say, a reciprocal relationship, and it's coming from your attempts to actualize, let's say, some sort of goal, right? But how you've understood yourself in any given moment is what this is based on. The unity of the world around you, your belief about the unity of the world around you, which you've then internalized and then act in accordance with, and then you can constantly reevaluate. And this is a constant reevaluative mechanism in terms of reason. And it's based upon the freedom of reason. If you dismiss the freedom of reason, this all crumbles away and it's determinism. Right. Do you see what I mean? But and then all, all truth is gone and there would be no point in this debate anyway. I don't. I don't necessarily think all truth is gone, right? I. I just don't see how you could show that I could have chosen differently, because I didn't. And I think more like I think the you could have chosen differently for the fact that you could have chosen at all. If you did not choose, then then there is if there is no choice, there is no reason. I think it's still fine to call it a choice. It's just that I always would have chosen A over B. What, you think that you can call something a choice if you always must do something, that you could not have acted otherwise? Well, I don't think you could know beforehand, because, right? Like, choose, choosing between, like, how would you define choice in this respect? Uh, taking one path instead of another, you know. Um, Multiple possibilities, like actualization of possibility. I suppose you could put it that way. So, how, how, so if, if you did not have the option to actualize one possibility over another in depending upon 
your own volition your own volition then how could you say it's a choice well it's still a choice because i went down this path instead of the other there was physically another path to go down but there wasn't that's the thing you're saying it's determined right there but there it's physically possible for me but it's, it's not it's not a violating a law of physics for me to not debate who cares about the laws of physics? This is a law of logic that you're trying to instantiate. Right, but I mean... So, you're, so who, who you're gives proposing... a shit? That's nomological. Laws of physics are, are also determined by laws of logic. There has to right. be logical foundations okay. for all but you're, it's, it's, it's not a contradiction for me to... Well, it is a contradiction, though. That's the, that's the How point. is Sorry, it? Sorry, I'm not interrupt. I don't, because it, you, you're saying that you, you... You are saying it's a choice, but then you could not have acted otherwise. I, when I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have ever acted otherwise because my scale of values would be given, right? We we treat well, that, give it values that, as given in praxeology. But values, I don't. That that's that 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 is our definite point of metaethical contention. Values are not given. Values are values are chosen. Um, how does it? How are we actually applying this to law? We may have gone off topic. Um, I think we're talking about uh, the whether an individual was responsible uh, yes, for, an, for an action from which they could not have acted otherwise. Right. So I would say that, yeah. like, to, to be very Sartrean here, we are condemned to be free. If you try to if you try to negate reason, you are ultimately going to negate any reasons that you have to negate reasons. Right. So. For the example of stepping on the sunglasses, the entire point, the reason why it is uh, an accident, the reason why they didn't deliberately do it, is because they didn't notice in time to stop themselves from stepping on it, right? Sorry, could you repeat that last part? I, I didn't really... So, the reason why we are saying that they don't have mens rea, why it was a mistake on their part is because they didn't recognize that the sunglasses were there in time to stop running right so so we're saying that well no because you could you could have the intention so for example men's so no because i think that that would that would be saying that the only reason that they stepped on them would be through a lack of awareness uh that their intention sorry that they did not have the intention to step on the sunglasses precluded their awareness their lack of awareness of the sunglasses where i disagree i would say that you could have like for example you could have the desire to stop right mm -hmm. and so not be intentionally doing wrongdoing but simply be physically committed to the action because of the force that you were engaged in in terms of jogging right but there was nothing irrational about jogging it just so happens that on this jog an accident occurred from which you could not have predicted Right, okay, but if they, we can imagine another scenario where they're jogging forwards and they see the sunglasses in time and then they decide to stop so they don't step on the sunglasses or run around them, something like that. Yes. Right? That would be, that would be, the, like, not, the accident would be prevented. Right. They prevented the accident. The yes. whole reason we're calling it an accident is because they didn't notice in time. No, because what, what, okay, you could say that if, like, in a hypothetical, if they could have noticed in time, like, in that respect, but I'm saying that they, like, you could notice before the incident has occurred, but be physically committed. And then you said that was not the case. Okay, right. Like, no, as in you said, I'm you said saying, that, I'm like, saying, even, responsible. I'm saying, even if they might be, like, literally, like, about to step on them, and then they look down and see, oh no, I'm about to step on sunglasses, and they might be physically incapable of not mm -hmm. stepping on them. They still don't yeah. have mens rea there. Because they didn't Absolutely. notice in time to stop before it happened. I would agree with that. I would, right. I would agree with that. So the reason so, why it's an accident is because they didn't stop doing it in time to prevent it from happening. Uh, I, I agree, but then you said that... that right. well, not, that you, but then that would be saying that, okay, the absence it's, of men's rear... So, like, for example, the absence of men's rear in this, in this aspect is not simply what judge, how we judge between a criminal act and a non-criminal act. In this, in this, so like, for example, if if an individual was to, um, if an individual was to have men, like, let's say, like, an individual was to have the intention of committing a crime, but never never actually had the opportunity, 
then they they had men's rear but then never committed the crime because the physical consequences have occurred if an individual did not have the intention but then due to no fault of their own did not have the awareness or or capacity to change their um it's weird because you're like you're arguing from a determinist standpoint that I've like you know and, and all of this is well, determined that's, anyway. That's the thing. So, I don't think the determinism versus free will. I don't think that matters as it pertains to this specific situation. What I'm saying well, is the reason why they don't have mens rea from stacking on the sunglasses is because they didn't realize that continuing forward would violate the property rights well, in yeah, time. We're gonna, we're Similarly. We can, in, we can agree on that. Right. And similarly... If they had had the inten that would, that would yeah. include the intention. Similarly, what, if, what, if... What I said is if in, in, the, in the original uh, pro proposal in this is that if an individual goes... If an individual is jogging along and steps on sunglasses but did not have the um, capacity to stop or did not have the ability to stop, then you're saying that it would... That, that you said they would still be responsible. I'm, if you I'm trying to analogize it to the Rose situation that we had before. So yes, I know you. We so we, one... we we agreed in the Rose situation that mm -hmm. as agree, uh, yeah. that the fact they they didn't intend to step on the roses, but it's still criminal. They still have to restitute the roses, right? Um, because they have broken the law by being negligent to the to holding to the like, right. the, the series of actions that they've committed has not being held to the confines of the law so they didn't notice in time that stepping forward would step onto some roses this is analogous they, to the jogger who didn't they, realize in time not, that stepping not, on the glasses they, they did not obey the law in the sense that they did not confine their jog to public property again you, the, so it relies on public property then but public property isn't a thing okay like okay i don't know what what would you call a, a, a public walkway then I, I don't think it, there is such a thing as public walkways. It's either owned okay. by someone or it's in nature. Okay, fuck. fuck. Well, let's just put them on a jog in the middle of the fucking in in the in, like. It's let's say it's a dirt path, right? I don't care at this point because I don't think it's relevant necessarily to the to right. the. Right. So uh, they're just in the woods somewhere. Right. It doesn't necessarily matter because I don't think the dispute isn't between them and the walk the person with the walkway. It's between them and the person with the glasses. So even if it was private property, fuck, you, you can make it who you know. Bill Gates owns the path. It doesn't matter. Bill Gates isn't involved in the dispute, right? Well, he, like, he might be if there are certain rules. So we'll just yeah, we'll put okay, it in the middle of the yeah, woods. We're, we're assume, yeah. So if we're assuming that the rule is in terms, let, let's say like we agree that he, to abide by the law, let's say he was legally engaged in the jog, right? Because that's the that's the scenario. Like, for example, a driver who's, you know, obeying the speed limit, that kind of thing when they're using the road versus a driver who's like breaking the speed limit or is drunk or, you know, texting or something like that. They're engaged in using this, uh, this piece of property, whether it's public or private. And then another individual who is also on this piece of property drops their sunglasses. The, there's nothing about them. Use, they have not engaged in a contradiction in terms of the intentionality that they've given to this series of events there is nothing irrational about what the jogger has done there has simply been an a by definition if it's an accident by definition unpredictable series of events right in which case and they the could not be held responsible for it they still could be just as they could with the rose garden because we can no imagine we, we can imagine for? the rose garden and the sunglasses they're both out in the middle of the woods right you can't have a rose garden that like so for example it couldn't be well, you could have a rose garden in the middle path. of the woods you couldn't have a rose like so for example let's just let's just keep it on like i was going to say public path but, I'll, but let's just say it's on the path like the rose garden couldn't like so for example if the rose garden trespassed onto the path like for example the roses fell onto the path and the man ran across them uh unaware then he has not done anything wrong right but this is the problem is that we're bringing it in to this issue because of it, public paths. That's why. Is, that's why I'm saying right. Let's just put them trespass. into the middle of the woods. It's not even about public path. It's about whether the individual is using properly property correctly, rationally. In okay. the case of being a jogger, uh, jogging on this path, they are. In the case of jogging beyond the path, the scope of the path, they have breached their. Le they 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 were obligated in taking the run to remain to, to operate within the confines of the path i mean you're, you're allowed to run through the woods you're allowed to do that 
Yes, you're allowed to. Yes, but the the point right. is, is that you're confined to not trespassing upon someone's private property. Exactly. Which is, and glasses yes. are private property. But there's not been a deliberate. Like, there's not been a trespass there in has the sense been. that the individual has has left their private property or dropped or mistakenly placed their private property onto somebody else's property, and the other person using this separate piece of property has used the property correctly, well, no, but no, who has... But the glasses the, haven't fallen onto somebody else's property, because we're in the middle well, of the woods. So they, they drop well, their well, glasses said whilst that they're climbing up a tree or whatever, I don't right? Know whether it's in the middle of the woods necessarily, or whether it's on someone's path, because the point is, is that the individual using the path is using it correctly. They are engaged in this... Right, that's, this is why it, we, need to take it, we, need to, we need to take it away from the path for a moment, because that complicates things. So we but move it into the woods. You can commit a crime... And right, totally and I'm passionate. trying to show you why. So we move it into the woods, right? Somebody's climbing a tree and their glasses fall off, and then they're climbing down the tree. Jogger comes along, doesn't realize that the glasses have fallen, and then they jog over the glasses, right? This is analogous to if somebody has a nice little rose garden in the woods. Certainly Jogger is jogging along, and then they step on these roses. What makes these disanalogous? Well, well the... What makes it analogous is the possibility to what well, is the is their commitment to using the path correctly. If they right, missed, there is no if, path, we're just in the middle of the woods. Okay, and if okay, so if we're in the middle of the, if you were saying if we're in the middle of the woods, uh, well, what makes the distinction between the rose garden and the path first of all? Like, how do we how do we see the distinction? How does it work? What uh, I'm I, I'm saying that they're analogous situations. No, but I'm 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 saying the path, like between the path and the rose garden, what differentiates? Where That's one what I'm saying. There is no path. It's in the middle of the woods. Well, no yeah, path. It's, it's a dirt path then in the middle of the woods. I'm, the, I'm the saying trail. not even any dirt path. No paths. Okay. okay, they're in the middle of the woods. What? How would the would this individual have? If this individual had could not have known, isn't that there's no signage, there's no sort of border, there's nothing. It just sort of leads from the woods straight, and there's no reason well, that there, they there, there definitely could have is some sort of delineation, some sort of a border, like you can see where the roses start and where the roses end, right? There is a definite border there, but they just didn't notice this border. They didn't notice that the roses were there. Right. They didn't notice... Th so, okay, so in this case, we've got an individual who's running through the woods. Um, They didn't notice the roses were there, mm -hmm. at least in time to stop. So they might have looked up and they're yeah. like, oh, shit, like they've been looking at the phone or something. Um... So we need to consider whether the individual's behavior was rational uh, in the first in the first instance. Whether like you are entitled to jog along through the woods looking at your phone, because if you are um, entitled to do that, and you are um, not obliged to have a level of awareness in doing that, which would preclude you trespassing upon this individual's property, they've committed no crime. So, right, so do you or do you not think that's criminal? Like, that's just... It depends. That's what I'm saying. It depends upon whether an individual has the... is obligated to have a certain level of awareness of an, of another individual's property. Do within, you think they have such an nature. obligation? Um, yes, depending upon signage. And I think that that's why I would say that there are reasonable, like, indications. Like, for example, let's say you, you should give people adequate opportunity to take action to avoid right. property. So let, let's let's have a. And if that's for, been done, let's let's, let's, add, let's add some signage to both situations. So okay. when the glasses so, fall off the person's face, they're saying, "Hey, hey, gla my glasses are there. Don't run forward." But the but the jogger's deaf, right? They can't hear. So be saying, "Hey, hey, glasses down there. Don't step on them." And in the rose garden, there's a big old sign which tragedy, says, yeah. "There are roses here." So so like it will be tragedy again. I'd say that then, the. Uh, then the should take. Uh, then this is an issue of. Um, this is an issue of a uh, of an institute. Uh, this is an in issue that needs to be resolved within the institution, and I think the res resolution would be more adequate signage. So if someone's deaf, then you write it up. If someone is, uh, or, or something like that, like it, it, you, it's whether an individual or, or if like you know, or an individual is allowed to have headphones in or something like that, rather than, let's say, be necessarily incapable. Like you know, they've actually taken an action to um let's say deafen themselves to the outside world whether that level whether taking that action in terms of awareness 
would be considered to be inconsiderate of other people's property. Now, I would say that it probably wouldn't be. But in terms of, let's say, you know, you're running through the woods and there's signs every fucking way. And let's be honest, you're not running through the woods if you're deaf. Um, I mean, deaf if, people are allowed to run. I'm not deaf. I mean, blind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and like, you're probably not running through uh, the I'm woods. Not, I'm not saying that they're blind and they just didn't notice the sign, right? Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, well, that's the thing. If, if that's where we would call it adequate signage. If the individual did not notice adequate signage, then yes, they have committed an act. That right. Wrong. But then, how do we determine what is adequate signage and what isn't? Well, yeah, that's that's difficult. So then you start talking about well, what is re what would we reasonably expect? How what what level of awareness would we expect um, individuals to uh, engage with in such a way that they are respecting themselves to others? Like clearly, people don't have to be constantly on edge. And worried that they've missed a sign. Like, did I see a sign? Like, was there a sign somewhere? Uh, you know, uh, what if there was a sign just there? I've got to go back. You know, like, clearly there is a level in which they would be disrespecting themselves. Right, but and then I this is this is adding a lot of arbitrariness to the law. When oh, we could weird. just we could just say we could just solve this by the libertarian approach. Right, we don't would have any of this arbitrariness. The libertarian approach by just uh, holding someone accountable when they're not. No men's well, they are accountable. They still violated property rights. They still that's initiated that's a that's conflict. Point. They did no. They did not like. I think that's. I think that's ridiculous, man. I think that's absolutely. Do you, do you think ridiculous. they don't initiate conflict over the use of the sunglasses when they step on them? I think that. Yeah, I think they don't initiate conflict. Okay, well then I'm allowed to deliberately step on them. If stepping on the sunglasses doesn't initiate a conflict over them, then I'm allowed to do it. No. Yes, because you said I it didn't initiate like, a conflict, so I'm allowed to step on their sunglasses. I'm allowed to look at it and deliberately step on them. In terms of being accountable for one's actions, you have to be able to reasonably take ownership of them. Um, so, if do you if think the, it's so if it's not initiation of conflict to step on someone's sunglasses, then I'm allowed to do it deliberately. If it is, no, then I'm not allowed to do it at all. You're, you're conflating the two actions. I'm saying in this circumstance, you are not initiating conflict. Like accidents happen, and so how do we how do we anyone. know? Where, That's I mean, the definition of an accident. You are initiating conflict though, because there is contradictory action, which you have caused. You've initiated conflict by definition. So it's like it's as if you want to divorce the possibility of chance. No, I don't it. want to do that at all. Or like irrational, or or or, or like unpredictable. No, so, there, so, there's, there's always you want risk to conflate, in life. And you want to conflate one event, which was criminal, I would argue, because of the irrationality of the agent involved, and that's what makes something criminal, not a, not a consequential approach. If you're a natural law theorist, this should be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be an irrational action. Right. So you have, to show the in, you have to show the irrationality of the individual's action. What was irrational about their action? But the base of law isn't rationality versus irrationality. It's conflict Basically, initiation versus conflict avoidance. But conflict initiation is justified in your case through rationality. Well, no, no, so I, I'm, I'm not that. justifying conflict initiation. You did. You said, you said that aggression impedes the possibility of a valid argument. And that's the problem. I, I said aggression could not be argumentatively justified. Right. And so it's irrational and wrong then. That's yeah. what makes it wrong. That's what makes yeah. it unjustified. So you could like, not justify yeah. aggression. So right. Therefore, so you, you could not justify stepping on those sunglasses, even if you didn't know about but it. How you you couldn't justify it. It's still the initiation how, of conflict. How you define aggression in this case is through the impedance of rationality. Uh, right? it's, it's, I mean, you if, could as frame it in some weird way. I've just defined it as the initiation of a conflict, though. That seems a whole lot easier. Initiation they have initiated conflict, conflict by stepping on the sunglasses. Okay, but like, do you not see how your argument for the initiation of conflict being bad is that it's irrational? But then when I say that, if moreover, an individual that you is could not, not propose that it's good you could without contradicting being, yourself. That, but then I propose that an individual is being rational, is not being irrational. I'm asking, how are they committing a crime when you're because they've initiated conflict? But your definition of how a conflict comes around is through being irrational unless you think you could be you do you think you could do you think you could commit like um engage in a conflict rationally i i'm saying that you could not hope to justify initiating that conflict so do you think you could rationally engage in conflict i don't know what the, you mean by initiating that. conflict 
uh, rational in the sense of um, improving your life or whatever you put it as. Um, but, but how would you would you define rationality? Dif- uh, more like I, I'm I'm talking. I define rationality generally in the Misesian sense, i.e., uh, you are rational if you're in, uh, behaving purposefully. Right. Okay. Well, fair enough. I, I would I would push back and say like I would I'll be happy to say that, but I would say that like an individual um, may be unaware of their or may not be aware of their own purpose, and that that would be them behaving in a way which was. Uh, because you could say that, for example, an individual is behaving purposefully as a child, trying to put a fork in a plug socket, or a. Or, no, I disagree or a mar- that that would be purposeful behavior. Right. Okay. As if their will isn't known, right? So you okay, could so say. If, yeah, I would agree with that in that in the same respect, right? So if so, we we would agree that to behave purposefully um, requires a level of self knowledge, right? Or or self or uh, yeah self-knowledge i would say probably yes because you need to understand yourself before you can understand uh your values and you know what ends you're aiming at okay and then so the and then rationality would also include that so then therefore because obviously with it being like uh uh, inferential like rash to be to be purposeful to be rational you have to be purposeful and to be purposeful you have to be uh you have to have some sort of self-knowledge yeah sure and so like a so an individual who is incapable of a certain level of self-knowledge would be precluded from rationality mm, sure yeah okay cool so yes by that standard by that standard do you think that you could rationally um engage in conflict yes because See, if you if you're purposefully initiating a conflict you know i i know that i am initiating a conflict here I um my end is to initiate a conflict and I want to do it right you know my end might be to murder my neighbor and I go ahead and do it I was acting rationally there uh, I couldn't justify this in argumentation I couldn't do that right so that's the thing so you so you, you think you could act rationally so this is this is this is like so in terms of self knowledge this is where I would push back I would say without considering the interest and the judgment of others, you're incapable of self-knowledge. And so to initiate a conflict would be definitionally irrational. I mean, how am I incapable of self-knowledge? But if I kill someone, am I legally a child and then therefore can't be held responsible? You are a criminal and you are being held responsible for... Right, so if, of- if you're holding me responsible, then I you must hold me as some sort of being who's capable of understanding the world yeah you are capable of understanding yeah so like so therefore i am aware i do have self-knowledge in this sense you have you have the necessary self-knowledge to know you should have done better so it's like it's like your purpose your understanding of your purpose was incorrect and so i am punishing you for your own good i think punishment is for the good of the criminal Right, but I I still had self knowledge, right? To a so limited I'm, I'm degree, still being rational. Well, to a limit, partially. Okay, so then you can rationally engage in conflict. That answers your Only question. Partially. So it'd be like this is the point. Like, if your conflict necess- necessitated your rejection of the other, then I would like to the to the nth degree, you reject all individual let's say you're a crazy mass murderer right and you want to kill everyone and that's your goal then your purpose is contradictory you believe that actualizing your actual you are actualizing your good when you are actualizing you're actualizing the right thing to do when you're actualizing the wrong thing to do and it's wrong against yourself that's what everything is wrong against I, i agree it is objectively unethical to initiate conflict i agree there it it's not that it's simply illogical. Right, because to try and propose that it's a good thing to do, you'd contradict yourself. Yes. Right. And, and you would be so you you would be assuming your a knowledge of self which was not true, which means you were irrational. And the criminal justice system is about correcting that irrationality within the state. Well, you're you're still acting rationally because you're still acting. It's just that you can't justify no, your children, actions you say, uh, you, unless you're saying that children aren't acting which like you know w- would would start a 
I, I don't think they really are acting, right? I think I see what you're saying there. I see what you're trying to like. Say, you're trying to say that they cannot take ownership of themselves in this respect, so they can't be responsible for their own actions. So it's not their action that they're doing. I would agree. I think that's a fair fair argument to make. I think that in terms of the criminal, you 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 know the individual. If when it comes to being an uh, you know a fully an adult with the full capabilities of reasoning, but has chosen not to, then you've endorsed then you are being punished in many respects for choosing to be an individual who has not taken the time to understand the ethics of the society from which they live. That is the irrational, that is the root irrationality that we are correcting within you. Do you mean if we actually just uh, wrap this up there because I've got to go somewhere soon? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. We can, we, uh, we can still do the Q&A. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, but just quickly do, do, you, do you see where the conflict between us might necessarily be then if in terms of if you think for example like my my argument would be that you lack the self-knowledge like that my my argument would be that you could not be responsible for something that you did that was rational to do so if you committed an action that was rational that we agree was rational then you are not responsible but you want to say that you are responsible even if your action was rational. Well, what I'm saying like, is, in like, if, if, in like, if these criminal actions like murder and stuff are stemming from a lack of self-knowledge and that implies that they are not rational, you couldn't be held responsible for such things. So we have to I hold mean, people responsible for such things, right? Well, in terms of the engagement of their reasoning, so there is like, are they irrational because of no fault of their own, i.e. they're a child of, or they're mad, in which case we would say that they're not responsible, or are they rational for because they've chosen not to be? They've they've engaged in such a way as to be irrational. That's what we're correcting. That's that's. But we, we can we can leave it there if if you want. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. So um, well, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been an interesting conversation at least. Anyway, I I, I can't deny that. I, I think uh, you know, like um, uh, you know you've pushed us on a few things i think i've pushed you on a few things and i think it's been at least um philosophically well fleshed out in some cases like you know i think uh, you know quite deep yep uh so it's been enjoyable um if chat has any questions for uh liquid zulu just drop them in and 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 you can ask them if you have any for me and uh how long do you want to have the q a for obviously uh maybe until like seven at the latest yeah so about 15 minutes there so yeah, so for the next 15 minutes, we'll do a Q&A. And uh, if you've got any questions, just drop them in. But yeah, like, uh, interesting conversation. I think that obviously, um, in some respects, uh, our notions of what the state should be versus the state right now obviously are radically different. I think that once applied to the uh, contemporary society, I think both of our structures would probably think that this state, in some respects, is unethical. Um, for different reasons, most likely. Some reasons I think would overlap, um, uh, and I think some reasons wouldn't. But you know, I think it's interesting that we'd both be arguing for two, uh, the actualization of two different, uh, two different political systems. Hmm. Well, I've got a question here for you. Interestingly enough. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what makes my decision to contribute to another person's project or an hourly basis with a fixed compensation necessary to outlaw, as you seem to demand? um sorry could, can i what, what was that <laughs> um what makes my decision to contribute to another person's project on an hourly basis with a fixed compensation necessary to outlaw as you seem to demand so like wage labor oh right yeah wages <laughs> like okay um yeah i think that uh i think one i think that hourly compensation doesn't respect the individual's property uh property rights in terms of the in terms of the way property comes from, I would argue that property is derivative from uh, labor. So this isn't, I'm not going to argue for labor theory of value. I think that is necessarily wrong. Um, but I do argue that labor is the expression of an individual's will, which takes an object and turns it into a product, naming they mix themselves uh, in terms of their essence into the object to create it into something different, to produce something different. Um, they are the efficient cause, if you will, of the now established object. 
which is why they, that's why they could claim ownership of it in the first place. An individual that is not being paid in relation to the value they produce for that object uh, in, and instead and, and not being treated as an end in themselves and instead as a means to an end, um, I would say is exploitative. Um, and I think that exp I would argue that exploitation in this case, so if you are using an individual uh, not treating their property rights as equal to your own uh, and you claim ownership of anything that they produce without adequate compensation, um, then I would say that this uh, infringes upon their property rights. And if they're not capable of owning, of holding property, um, then one, I would say you're not because I think it's a universal concept, but moreover, they're not capable of then signing a contract because they are not a free um, ethical agent who can endorse uh, a contractual arrangement. You are treating them as if they are, their reasoning is not as capable as your own. And that would be my, that would be my response. So Marxist alienation. We got anything on your end yet? Um, let's have a look. Um, uh, why do so many people mention Schopenhauer in this free will versus determinant debate when he's obviously compatible? That was just for me. I think, uh, yeah, well, yes, but compatibilism is a subsect of, of free of uh, determinism in, in many ways. Uh, it doesn't preclude uh, hard determinism. It simply says that you're an owner of your action uh, whilst, uh, whilst determined. Um, how, okay, he has, he has one for you, I think. Um, how would an uncap society stop people from accumulating enough wealth to monopolize an area and have the workforce move into company towns like Hershey, Pullman, and Ludlow? Um, well, monopolize an area, that sounds a whole lot like private property to me. If uh, some em employer uh, has some private property and they want employees to come and live on that property and the employees agree, I don't see the problem with that. Okay, so it's not, so you would, um, so you wouldn't say there would be a need to stop it. it Definitely not. Response. Yeah, okay. it's consensual. Okay. Um, if anyone else has a question or if your site has a question. No questions over here. And none so far over here. We can call it there if you want. Um, That's fine. Yeah. Uh, rather than just wait around for one at a time. They had the opportunity, you know, whatever. They, sh they didn't look at the ad adequate signage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, anyway, thank you, Liquid Zulu. It's, uh, it's been a good debate, and I uh, hope you have a nice day. You too. Uh, thanks for coming on. It was oh, great. And, uh, do you, you want to shout yourself out, actually? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Liquid Zulu, youtube.com forward slash Liquid Zulu. I do anarcho-capitalist videos. I know your audience will love all that, so... S same to your audience i'm a perspective philosophy i'm a vegan socialist um i cover ethics politics um and uh just uh, metaphysics epistemology all philosophy so yeah um yeah you can find me on pers uh, perspective philosophy uh on uh, youtube but um thank thank you again and uh, i hope you have a nice day yep see ya see ya uh...